Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is Monday, and what that means, it's Monday with the McDougals, where we have the pleasure of spending some time with Dr. John McDougal and Mary. And Dr. McDougal is going to give a brand new lecture on hypertension and heart disease. But we like to start the show with a success story, somebody who's found the work of Dr. John McDougal and completely transformed their life. So today our special guest is is a superstar in her own right in the plant-based world. Her name is Plantiful Kiki, and she's here to tell Dr. McDougal what his work meant to her. Please welcome Kiki. Hi, thank you for having me. This is so exciting for me. Well, this is the first time we've met, you know, I, I, I don't know anything about you. I'd sure like to hear about it. Yeah. So I was actually tricked into reading your book, The Starch Solution. I had a friend very intelligently trick me into reading your book. I had tried so many diets over the years and I am small. I'm like five, three, and I, my weight just teetered between 189 and 193 pounds. And no matter what I did, I just could not lose any significant amount of weight or get my health to improve it all. And I did everything. I did low carb. I did keto. My doctor had called me and said, you know, you are pre-diabetic. Your cholesterol and blood pressure look terrible. Your triglycerides look terrible. You need to change the way you're eating. So I did, you know, what most people do is I went straight to Google to see what I should do about, you know, being pre-diabetic. And I was eating high protein, low carb, but high protein really meant like high fat. (laughs) So I just like, wasn't getting any better. And I had called a friend and she's like, you need to check out this doctor that helps people heal diabetes and lose weight with potatoes. And I was like, no, like I am Latina diabetes is real for my people. Like it's a scary, like I cannot be eating potatoes. I can't eat carbs. And she's like, you know what? You just, he helps thousands of people check out his book. So I went straight to Barnes and Noble. I picked up your book and I got to tell you, I read the whole book in one day. I didn't put it down. I just couldn't. I felt like all of a sudden I had all my power back because I felt powerless. I felt like my health was just slipping away from me and I had no control and no power to get my health back. So a few, you know, a few chapters in, I realized that she had neglected to tell me it was a plant-based diet (laughs) because had she told me that first, I probably would have just completely ignored her. So by the end of the book, I was like, okay, I guess I'm, I guess I'm going plant-based. So I, my husband gets home from work and I had like thrown everything out of the kitchen and told him, okay, this is what we're doing. You know, the, the kids, all of us were doing this. I need to get my health back. And thankfully I have a super supportive husband. And he was like, I will give you four months. I will not complain for four months, but then I'm probably going to go back to eating, you know, meat, the meat that I like to eat. So I was like, I will take that challenge. But, but what happened afterwards is I was eating pasta and bread and potatoes and we were watching our fat intake. And for the first time in my life, weight was just melting, just melting off of my body. And in just a matter of like three months, I had already lost about 35 pounds. I couldn't believe it. And I hadn't exercised. Like I'd been, I was started going on a walk every day. But after three months, I went back to my doctor and she was like, whoa, like, what are you doing? My cholesterol, my blood pressure, my triglycerides were perfect. My blood sugar that had not been below 135 fasting in years and years was now like a perfect, like 83 or 86, something in the eighties. And she was just completely blown away. So I'm like, well, you got to read this book. You got to learn about this doctor. But the best part was that my husband who had given me four months, he managed to lose about 45 pounds without even trying. And all his like mystery aches and pains disappeared. All of our allergies disappeared. Like my kids no longer had seasonal allergies, just gone. (laughs) And we've never looked back. (laughs) So I just want to 
Thank you so much. Your work has been completely life-changing for me. I started my own YouTube channel just to get the word out because everybody around me was so sick of listening to me talk about it. And I've just been able to share you with so many people. I'm so, so grateful because not only did you change my life, but you've changed so many more lives through my life. And that's what life is about, is just continuing to pay it forward. So I'm super, super grateful. Well, we have, we have another soldier added to the battle. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. that's, you know, and, and as you said, I mean, I listened to every word you said, and, and I, I never get tired of hearing these kinds of uh, results and never get tired of hearing that I've helped people. But uh, once people understand this, the very simple basic principles and give themselves a test, they never go back. You'll never be looking for another diet or another gimmick or another supplement because Absolutely. you know you 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 understand and you're set free. Yeah, uh, that's my goal is to set people free, and because they're suffering so terribly, and I, I appreciate yeah. your story. Well, thank you. It's just, and any time I've experimented implementing some other things just to see, I always come back to what you teach because there's so much simplicity in what you teach. And when it comes to the question of how do I maintain my weight and how do I maintain my, my health? There's just, there's no question. You just, you stick to the basic and it maintains itself. So just thank you so much. Yeah. Pe people have, people have to start believing in their own body. Your body yeah. is not a mistake. Uh, you know, you, every one of you was, was born to be healthy, to function well, to feel good. And if, it's not, if, you're, if you're not, then it's not a problem with your design or your makeup. It's a problem with the rules you're following. And until yeah. you find the right set of rules, you'll always be searching and you'll always have, have difficulty with your health. You'll be out of control as you said it. But once you, once you discover this simplest, simple answer, that it's the food and uh, what you need to eat is a starch-based diet with yeah. some fruits and vegetables. And then all of a sudden you, you change yourself, you change your husband, you change your children, you're changing your family, and you're going to be a big part in changing the world, which needs, needs all the help it can get. So thanks for joining the Army. Yes, thank you. Hey, Kiki, do you mind if I ask you a question? I don't yeah. want to give everything away because Kiki is one of the experts on the upcoming Truth About Weight Loss Summit, which you can register for in the chat, as is Dr. McDougall. So I don't want to give the whole enchilada away, but can you talk about one of the things you said is how when you start experimenting, adding more fat to your diet, what happened? Yeah. My... And I've, I've tried this several times. Like I tell people all the time, like I have gained and lost the same five pounds several times because, you know, you want to, you want to have a little nut butter and a, that's a slippery slope. So every time I have experimented with adding more fat back into my diet, yeah, I've, I start to gain weight almost instantly. So I've definitely learned what the tolerance is for myself. And you just stick, I just, that's the magic. I stick to a high carb, low fat plant-based diet. It is that simple or I can't maintain my weight. <laughs> and you know, you know what? It always works. And it's not like, like occasionally it works or, you know, if you think right. the thoughts, it works or, you know, it always works. And that's because you fixed the problem and it yep. is, it's simple. It, I mean, it is, you haven't mentioned this, but it has cut your food bill dramatically. Oh and yeah. It makes kitchen cleanup a lot easier. And so there's just, there's, it's all positive. If there's something that stood out as negative, then I would question my truth. You know, but this fits your religious, your religious feelings, beliefs. It fits your understanding of the environment and how to save the planet. It fits in terms of your food bill. I mean, they're, they're just, there's just nothing that it doesn't have a positive answer for or with. And if it did, if I can say if it did, if there was something that stood out there, like, okay, I lost weight, but I got more diabetes, or, you know, my, my costs went up in medical care, or, you know, I start questioning what I was doing, but uh, I haven't had, to, I haven't had that need to question what I was doing, because so far, and I've been at this for 44 years, so far, everything turns out to be correct. And, uh, until it, it stops doing that, I'll keep with the same old stuff. You know, they say, they say, why do you teach the same old stuff? And the reason is, is because the truth don't change. Absolutely. Yep. 
Wow. Thank you so much, Kiki. And thank you for all the great work you're doing. I so appreciate your time. And thank you again for being on the summit. We can't wait to hear your talk. Yep. Thank you. We'll see you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Uh, Dr. McDougall, I know you probably don't have time to follow people on social media, but she's a big deal and she's sweet uh-huh. and she, it, it, she, people really love her and she, she all uh, talks about you. So I'm so glad we were able to share this with you. So I know you are dealing with a topic every other week for us. And last time it was, uh, was breast cancer. Diabetes. Diabetes. And two times ago, it was breast cancer. Right, right. And so now we have hypertension and heart disease, the number one killer among men and women. So anytime you're ready, please feel free to. Well, you know, AJ, I got involved in this talk and I decided it had to be either high blood pressure or, di- or, or heart disease. And what I picked was heart disease and we'll save high blood pressure for another time. But I have lots of important things to share with you. I've enjoyed putting this lecture together very much. And I'm glad you gave me two weeks because it required the entire two weeks for me to to tell a story that uh, I think will be understandable for all of you. You're, of course, going to have to pay close attention to what I have to say and understand the underlying principles of what I have to say. But hopefully I can make it entertaining enough to keep you from falling asleep. Listen, I can can say one thing. You may be many things, Dr. McDougall, but one thing you are not is ever boring. Yeah, that's what I that's what I told Mary when I met her. I said, you know, you might not always be happy, but you're never going to be bored. And uh, she'll tell you when she comes on in a little while, she'll tell you that she's never been bored. We've been at this for well, we just uh, celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary just uh, just this month. Oh, happy so, anniversary. Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, it was a milestone and uh, something I'm very proud of. 50 years, I'm guessing. 50 years. Yeah, it's been 50 years. So, and you know, AJ, just to, just to add a note, uh, Mary and I met in September of 1971. Uh, we were engaged to be married six weeks later, and we were married six weeks after that. And, you know, a lot of you may think that this was rushed, but my parents were very wise people, and uh, they taught me that... Uh, you know, I, I will be able to recognize the truth and just don't fool myself. I can recognize, you know, if you're honest with yourself about how you feel about things, then, then everything will work out. So, you know, I dated a few women and prior to that, and it was fun, but you know, I never felt like it was the person I wanted to spend my life with. But when I met Mary, you know, instantaneously, I knew this was the right person. And the other thing that my parents told me is that you must marry a happy person because you'll never make her happy. Now, initially I, I took that as a, as a insult on me, you know, the fact that I would make her unhappy, but that wasn't the way she was, they were trying to teach me is that you can't change people. You know, you, you have to take a look at the, the folks you engage with and they're gonna be the same regardless. And I had the fortune of mar- marrying a happy person and one that was also very tolerant. As you, many of you know, who know Mary and I, and other, otherwise, we wouldn't have survived for 50 years. Well, let's get into the topic of heart disease. And of course, that's the number one killer in the Western world. And uh, this is the discussion that I, I would like to have with you if uh, I was your doctor. But this is the kind of discussion that all doctors should have with their patients. You need to know some of the, the basic things, the basic uh, principles, and I'm gonna share them with you. And I'm also gonna share a lot, a lot of scientific information, but that's for you to, to delve into later. You know, I'll show slides that uh, show many of the studies and you might say you might be professionally interested or for whatever reason, it may be important enough for you to go and look up the basic research. So I've provided it for you. Just, you know, hit stop, pause on your, on your playback of uh, this video and you can see the research. You can easily go to Google or the National Library of Medicine. You can read the papers that I've read and you can find out that I have not exaggerated and I've told you the truth. So even though I have a lot of information to share with you and there will be even more information if you take advantage of the slides that I put together, and not just over the last two weeks, this has been going on for decades, uh, then I think you'll have uh, the information that you need to protect yourself and your family and your friends from unnecessary treatments, and you'll be able to help them get well. Uh, The classic symptom of heart disease is chest pain, but there are many things that cause chest pain. It could 
they come from come from your esophagus and often people have indigestion or GERD and they worry they have a heart attack, but of course that's not the case, even though indigestion and GERD are dietary diseases, obviously what you put in your esophagus is what determines whether it feels good or feels poorly. Uh, you can get chest pain from the uh, costochondral cartilage, which is, which is a, a part of the rib cage. And it can be easily inflamed. We call that uh, costochondritis. The, the membranes around the heart can get inflamed and you can get pain from that. That's called pericarditis. A heart attack is what you fear. And a heart attack is usually uh, usually experienced as uh, pain in the front of the chest and maybe on the left side a little bit towards the center. And uh, sometimes the pain travels up uh, up to the jaw on the left side and in the into the left arm. And it is, uh, it is a pain that you've never experienced before, usually. And it lasts uh, for hours. You know, people describe it as if an elephant sat on my chest. But it's not always that way. About 12% of people don't have any chest pain at all. No, they don't have any signs or symptoms of, of having a heart attack. So sometimes it's a silent disease. And then uh, there's the problem of angina, which is not a heart attack. It's a matter of having uh, insufficient blood flow to the heart muscle. And the heart muscle hurts when it doesn't get enough blood. Now, the nice thing about angina is it goes away when you rest. Usually it only lasts a few minutes. So we have some very effective anti-anginal medications out there. So let's, uh, you know, if you have chest pain, you might think about uh, whether it's a heart attack or not. I, one thing I do wanna tell you, and I'm gonna tell you several times through this presentation, if you have sudden onset of severe chest pain, you need to get to the hospital. Because if the, the cardiac team can treat you within 90 minutes of the onset of chest pain, or, or certainly within six hours, then they can make a difference. They can preserve heart muscle and maybe save your life. So even though I'm gonna give you a message about how intervention by the medical profession doesn't work, there are circumstances where it does work and that's in an acute emergency situation where you have sudden onset of chest pain. And if you have the fortune of getting into the laboratory, into the, uh, the theater where they perform this procedure, uh, Doctors can make a difference. They can dissolve the blood clot that has recently formed and you know, maybe save your life, certainly save some heart tissue. Uh, if you, uh, the best way to find out whether or not you have uh, a tendency towards heart trouble and what your likelihood of having a heart attack or stroke or other artery problems is, well, I mean, the most definitive way would be uh, to, to discover it at autopsy, or, but that's, that's pretty drastic. Uh, you uh, might also undergo a, a procedure such as a, an angiogram. That, that's pretty drastic too. But you can get a good indication of what your chances of having closures or closures of your arteries by just taking a simple blood test that is, you know, costs a few dollars, five, ten dollars, and doesn't cause any any harm to you other than a, a prick in where they insert the needle and. You get a value, a cholesterol level. And so based on your cholesterol level, whether or not you have significant lesions, and those would be lesions, uh, closures of 50% or greater, we call that significant. For This is for a, a man under the age of 40. And uh, the chance of having a significant lesion, let me just give you a few figures. If your cholesterol is under 200, you have a 20% chance of finding lesions on an angiogram. If your cholesterol is say 250, you have nearly a 50% chance of finding lesions when they do an autopsy or an angiogram. Now, my high cholesterol was uh, 338 milligrams per deciliter. And at just knowing that, you know, I discovered it when I was in my early twenties that my cholesterol was that high. Uh, you, you, I would have known if I had this chart that I had over a 90% chance of having significant artery closure, significant ath atherosclerosis. Well, many of you know my history. I had a massive stroke at age 18 and uh, my blood cholesterol predicted that I was going to have that kind of problem. Or you can also tell whether or not you have disease based on your age. Uh, based on your age, uh, uh, the chance of having uh, significant lesions that are described as moderate or severe increases as you get older. Why? Because you've eaten the Western diet for more years. You know, you've uh, 
you, you put more cholesterol and fat into your artery system. You've done that by eating animal foods and also other junk doesn't help either. So if you're uh, 28 years old, you've got a 22% chance of finding significant blockages. If you're my age, which is uh, almost 75, you have a 90% chance of having these problems. And that's of course, people who are eating the Western diet. You know, we're not talking about people who have eaten a healthy diet. Now, even though my cholesterol was at a top of 338 milligrams per deciliter when I was in my early 20s, you know, I've had my cholesterol checked uh, more than a dozen times over the last uh, 15 years. And my cholesterol runs between 100, 137 to 151 milligrams per deciliter. So you could change all that. And even though I had a stroke at 18 and you know, anybody would have predicted that I'd had, I would have had uh, <clears throat> heart surgery and maybe be dead by my early thirties, I'm still functioning. I'm still doing well. I don't, have a, I don't have a bit of chest pain. So I have to assume that my arteries are in darn good shape, at least as far as having a risk of having a serious problem. Uh, atherosclerosis is a disease due to an uncontrolled fork and spoon that keeps shoveling unhealthy components of your food into your body and your body is malnourished. And as a result, the arteries get diseased. Uh, you have <clears throat> globs of fat uh, that are incorporated under the thin wall of the artery. You have the slivers of cholesterol that get in under the artery wall and they cause inflammation. Kind of, kind of like if you stuck a sliver of wood under your skin, uh, you would have inflammation from that sliver of wood in, in your hand, say. And uh, what you'd see is you'd see swelling and redness. And soon what would happen if you left that sliver in your hand is you would develop a pustule. And eventually what would happen if you didn't take the sliver out, and you would because you have nerves in your hand, you would uh, develop a scar tissue that would cover up that sliver of wood. So that's the natural process of healing. Now, in this case, we have a system that has no arteries, or excuse me, no nerves. So you can feel nothing. This is a silent disease because the arteries are, are, are not accompanied by a nervous system that tells you that there's a problem. And so you have this disease going on unbeknownst to you. And you get the, uh, the swelling and the redness and if you had nerves, you'd feel the pain and, and you could measure the heat. You can actually measure the heat of the, uh, of the uh, progression of atherosclerotic lesions. So at the same time that disease progresses, uh, the body is healing itself. The problem is, is that <clears throat> the damage from the fork and spoon outpaces the ability of the body to heal itself. Your, your body never stops trying to heal. So what you have to do is just stop the damage and uh, then you get the results that you're looking for. You can uh, take a look at the arteries in a relatively safe way, relatively inexpensive with, with x-rays. We have x-rays tied to computers that do heart scans. And we even put contrast material now and do heart scans that, that, that show pictures of the heart arteries as good as an angiogram would do. And one of the things you see when you do these uh, heart scans is you see calcification of the arteries. And calcification represents old, old lesions. You may have noticed this in some other areas of inflammation of your body. Maybe you weren't aware of it, but for example, you've probably heard about bursitis and tendonitis. That's where the bursas and the tendons, say in the arm, are chronically inflamed. And if it's been going on for a long time, you take x-rays, you see calcification of the tendons and the bursas. Uh, the classic sign of tuberculosis, which is due to a bacterium that affects the lungs, is a, a miliary calcification. You know, in other words, you have calcification all over the lungs. And it's from chronic inflammation due to this, uh, this bacterium that infects the lungs. And, and one other case that you may recognize as far as old, chronic, scarred, calcified lesions is if you get a mammogram. What's often reported is that you have calcification of your milk ducts. Well, this just represents long-term years and decades of inflammation of your milk ducts in your breast. And, and finally, finally, calcium and scar tissue is laid down. The thing that I want you to understand from this is when you see calcium on a heart scan, 
it just re represents old disease. And I know if you get a heart scan, you're going to be terribly worried about it. But they, those are old scars. And if you change your evil ways, the old scars will probably stay there, but you won't have any further progression. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> time-honored classic way of uh, showing whether or not the arteries are plugged by blockages is to do an angiogram. And that's where they stick a catheter. It's usually in the leg, sometimes in the arm. And here's the catheter here, and it's fed up into the root of the aorta. And the dye is blown into the arteries. And what you see is you see shadows that are, are right here. They're, they're, the arrow points to a shadow. And, these are old fibrous non-lethal plaques that have been there for, for decades. But that's what worries the patient and what the doctor uses as an excuse for why you should have heart surgery. You know, we're, we're taught in medical school how to sell this procedure. Let me give you a, a, a typical scenario that occurs is uh, we'll pick a man having a heart attack and what happens is the doctor comes into the patient's room and his wife is there and he says to the wife, uh, come on over here, I, I wanna show you something. And he puts up this particular x-ray and uh, the wife looks at it and she's, he's, he says to her, you know, uh, you know what we call this lesion here? You know what the, we, we call this right here? What, what do we call this lesion? You, you folks know, we call it a widow maker. How can you resist operating on a widow maker? You know, the wife leaves and the doctor comes in and visits the patient and the doctor may carry on a conversation such as, you know, I met your wife and I got a chance to meet your, your children and you want, you want to stay alive long enough to see them graduate and marry and start their own families and have grandkids, don't you? Well, I want you to know you're not going to leave the hospital you're not going to see sunshine unless you submit yourself to this procedure. A procedure that treats old scars. And we're going to talk about this. You're going to understand this in detail. It's important that you understand what I'm trying to share with you, that what the doctors are looking at, what they can see, and what they treat are old, fibrous, sometimes calcified, non-lethal, in other words, they don't kill, scars. Uh, before we get into the discussion, I want you to know that this goes on in the entire body. You have over 60,000 miles of blood vessels in your body. And these blood vessels are effective and they close down in various areas of the body. And we name the disease based upon which arteries close down. For example, if the arteries in the eyes close down, we call that macular degeneration, which is the most common cause of blindness in the general population. If, uh, <clears throat> second, I have to take care of, of some housework here. All right, we'll get back to. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry. No problem. Uh, I, know, I, need to, I need to know how to find you. Oh, I'm so embarrassed here. I don't know quite what, exactly what to do. Are you trying to play a video? No, I'm trying to get you. I'm trying to get you back. Oh, you're here, Dr. McDougall. You can see me? Absolutely. We can see oh, you, and we can no, see. No, I, I can't. I can't see. I can't see you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I've got my camera on. Yeah, I know, but you know, I've kind of lost the whole picture. I'm sorry. Yeah, you know what, I, what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is I'd I'd like to reconnect because it's going to be a tough presentation for me to do without seeing the slides. Oh. Okay. I don't know any other way to get back, and I'm just going to kind of start over. All right. Before. Okay. If you'd like to do that, I'll just talk to the people while you're. All right, let's yeah. let's let's see if we can stop this and start it again. Whatever you like. You can stop slideshow or you could come back in. Oh, all right. Now I'll, I'll keep the there you go. Oh, there we are. Okay, there we go. So we could just kind of edit that part out, I hope. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
All right. Yeah, we'll let Charles help us. Can you see that okay? Uh, I don't see any slides right now. All right, well then, Just let's you. see. All right. There you go. All right, thank you very much. Uh, sorry for the interruption here. Let's just get back to where we were. Okay, this is a good place to start over again. Uh, what I want you to understand is that this is a disease of all the arteries throughout the body, not just the heart. And uh, we have over 60,000 miles of arteries and blood vessels in the body. And we name the disease based upon the arteries that are closed, what organ is affected. For example, if you uh, close the, the blood vessel system, the arteries to the eye, the most uh, sensitive seen part of the eye is the macula and you get macular degeneration. Macular degeneration is the most common cause of blindness in adults in Western countries. If you close the arteries to the ears, you get hearing loss. Uh, you also get tinnitus and you get dizziness because there's one artery that goes to your inner ear. And if that's compromised, then you develop these kinds of problems. Uh, strokes, I mentioned to you that I had a stroke when I was 18 years old. That happens when you close the arteries to the brain, close the arteries to the heart and you have a heart attack. You close the arteries that feed large blood vessels and you have uh, aneurysms. Uh, John Ritter, the TV star, he had an aneurysm, of course, uh, he, had, he got national attention because of it. You uh, <clears throat> close the arteries to the kidneys and you have kidney failure, uh, to the bowel and you get a bowel infarct. Uh, if you close the arteries to the, to the spine, uh, you develop uh, degenerative disc disease. The, the spine is made up of bones and between the bones are, um, are discs, uh, they're cushions. And uh, they're supplied by various arteries that get their nutrients, their oxygen, and so on, through an indirect system. <clears throat> and if you uh, end up having a back pain, what this can be related to is the fact that you're having angina or low blood supply to the back. This is a common cause. We have autopsy studies that show this. To get degenerative disc disease, what happens is the blood supply of the spine gets compromised severely and the disc degenerate. I mean, if you go to the doctor with a ruptured disc and you ask doc, what, what caused my ruptured disc? The doctor says it was caused by degenerative disc disease. And you should be asking, hey doc, well, what made my disc degenerate? Well, what caused the disc to degenerate to the point where you, you took a step or made a turn? You didn't lift up a piano or a Volkswagen to do it. You just made a, a, a normal motion and the discs were so weak that they ruptured. And that's due to low blood supply to the spine. You close the arteries to the legs and you develop pain when you walk, it's called intermittent claudication. When the arteries to the legs close down very severely, you develop gangrene. Now here's something that will cause you to have attention to what I'm talking about. And that is you close the arteries to the penis and you become impotent. That's the most common cause of impotence. And uh, what happens is uh, the penis becomes erect because of the filling of a spongy material. And when you compromise the arteries, the spongy material doesn't fill, you don't get an erection. So that's how you develop uh, impotence. It's not lack of interest in, in, in other people. So there are all kinds of, uh, of different organs that get affected in the way that we're talking about. All right, now to, to begin this discussion, this is very important for you to understand. The reason it's important for many of you to understand is because you're gonna look for the easy way out. You're gonna look for a treatment that doesn't involve you to make a lot of effort. And of course, doctors have those kinds of treatments. You, wanna, you want something that's kind of Star Wars, modern technology. And so we need to look at the standard treatment of artery disease you need to know what the real results are of heart surgery. And that's where we're gonna focus our attention is heart surgery. So once, once I put this in perspective for you and you realize that you're not gonna be saved by the medical profession, then you'll start looking for other answers, which I'm gonna also give you as we go along in the slide presentation. Uh, 
the most common procedure done, and there are a million done a year, it's developed in 1977, is an angioplasty. And this is where a catheter is inserted usually in the groin, in the leg, and it's fed up into the heart. And uh, what, what would they do, I'll show you in just a second, is they fix the, the, the blockages. Sometimes uh, this procedure is, uh, is performed through, through an artery in the arm, but usually it's the leg. So they feed this catheter up into the heart arteries and uh, into the area of blockage. And the catheter has a balloon on it and uh, they inflate the balloon and it breaks up the blockages. And this is good. I mean, you could relieve uh, chest pain by breaking up the blockages. But unfortunately, the process of breaking up the blockages releases products of injury that cause the blood to clot. And as a result, half the arteries so treated are completely closed down by subsequent blood clots within five months. And doctors realized this soon after they started doing the procedure. And the next phase of doing angioplasty was to add, add stents. In this case, bare metal stents, which prop the arteries open and help prevent the formation of blood clots. Now it's kind of like a Chinese finger puzzle that you expand. And once you expand these stents, uh, you can't take them out and you can't unexpand them. They're there permanently. Now, you know, that was a good idea, except for one thing, and that's the body does not like to have bare metal in it. And so what it does is it tries to cover up the bare metal and it does it by proliferation of the, the cells and the inside lining of the artery, the enema. And as a result of this cell proliferation, it completely closes down the arteries in 40% of the cases within a year. And so doctors had to figure out how in the world they can stop this cell proliferation. Well, there's a whole, a whole segment of the, of the medical profession that deals with cell proliferation. And these are oncologists with cancer chemotherapy. And so they, they developed drugs that, uh, <clears throat> that they could impregnate into the bare metal stents that would slowly come out of the bare metal stents and keep the cells from proliferating. So these, these bare metal stents, and they're what are popular these days. In fact, 90, 95% of the procedures are done with bare metal stents. They are called drug eluding stents because the cancer chemotherapy, so to speak, agents slowly come out of the, uh, of the, uh, of the stent. And uh, as a result, it keeps uh, the cells from proliferating. You've got the stent there, which keeps the blood clots from forming. But it was soon discovered that, again, the body doesn't like bare metal in it. And there was a high rate of sudden death after placing these drug eluding stents. And so the answer to that was to add to the patient's uh, treatment drugs that uh, stopped the blood from clotting. These would be aspirin and drugs like Plavix. But the problem is, is the drug eluding stents are fully eluded. All the drug is gone after about four months. And so in that case, now you're dealing with a bare metal stent and you don't need to take these extra, what we call anti-platelet therapy drugs anymore. And these can be discontinued usually after four months after the stent is placed in the heart artery. Certainly by 12 months, they can be stopped. Well, let's take a look at the results of all this effort, all this technology, all this science. And let's take a look at the, the research that has been done to prove whether or not it works, whether or not we keep people alive, keep them from going for further heart surgery, keep them from having heart attacks. And one of the first studies done was the, the OAT trial and this is the occluded artery trial. And it was done on nearly 2,200 stable patients who had had total occlusion um, three to 28 days after the heart attack, they had the procedure done. There were people with high risk of having another heart attack. And what did they find? They found that angioplasty, which is uh, percutaneous interventions, did not reduce the risk of occurrence of death or reinfarction or heart failure. This is really disappointing. And as a matter of fact, people who had the procedures done, the angioplasty procedures done, 
they ended up having an excess of uh, reinfarction, uh, in other words, further heart attacks uh, when they followed up for four years. This was disappointing to say the least. And then we had the Courage study, which was nearly 2,300 patients who had severe heart disease. And they divided them into two groups. And what they found is this intervention did not reduce the risk of death, heart attacks, or other major cardiovascular events. That was disappointing. And other studies were subsequently done. And you might ask yourself, well, you know, what, what about studying people longer and more severely ill people? If you take a look at all the studies done, and this was published in 2012, at that time they had 12 randomized clinical trials involving 8,000 people. You're basically looking at all the data. What they found was that uh, intervention did not reduce the risk of mortality or cardiovascular death or non-fatal infarctions or the need for having further heart surgery done. Yeah, all the studies showed this when they looked at them together. Well, how, how about long-term? Maybe, maybe they didn't wait long enough uh, after the procedure. Well, here's uh, 15 years, study of 15 years, in other words, long-term survival. They, they found no benefit. And, and how, about, how about if you take a look at more severely occluded arteries, you know, ones that are totally occluded and you treat those arteries well, they did that and uh, they found out there was uh, no reduction in, in risk of dying. One, one of the, uh, the writings from the Annals of Internal Medicine that I really enjoy is uh, about this procedure, angioplasty. And it's titled uh, Money Fund and Angioplasty. And uh, they note that there's uh, no survival benefit from doing these procedures. And then they go on and say something that I think is really telling. We suggest that the combination of three factors never so closely associated before in the history of medicine has been a synergistic, has been synergistic in promoting coronary angioplasty. It's very lucrative. Patients are mostly self-referred and it's fun. I mean, this is done in an operating room theater and the technicians, the doctors, they go in there and they pass these catheters and the catheters have to be bent around some pretty severe curves and you know as as the procedure progresses there's cheers from the crowd this is very ego enhancing well the american college of cardiology and the american heart association uh, they looked at the data that i just showed you and uh they were concerned to the point where in 2007 they told cardiologists to stop doing these procedures on people who have chronic coronary artery disease. And then they studied the impact of their recommendations. And this is one of the two studies. And the title of the study is the impact of national clinical guideline recommendations for revascularization of persistently occluded infarct related arteries on the clinical practice of medicine. In other words, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, they went to the trouble of looking at all the data and telling doctors to stop doing this. Uh, what was the response from the medical business? Well, the response was no change, no change. And in, in the article, and as they say, there are two articles that looked at this. In the article, they said, this is of concern. First, because patients continue to undergo costly and ineffective procedures. And they also said it seems to be a waste of money to take and do these, these assessments and to turn around and make recommendations to our colleagues because they don't respond. In an editorial, they really put it in perspective. They said personal financial gains are the reason for people doing procedures that result in no benefit. Well, there are risks to angioplasty, uh, sticking this catheter up into the coronary arteries and blowing them up and placing stents and placing drug eluting stents. Uh, the risk of death is uh, less than 1%. Serious complications, less than 5%. But that's in talented people. In bad hands, uh, the risk of complications can be as high as 18%. And 
death can be as high as 2% of the patients. And I want to tell you folks, there are a lot of bad hands out there. You know, you, you need to be very careful about picking your technician. But there is a place for angioplasty. And I, I want to make sure that I emphasize this enough. In, in the case of an emergency, if you have a sudden heart attack, and I told you this in the beginning, I'm going to tell you again, I'm going to tell you one more time. If you have the sudden onset of a blood clot forming in your heart arteries, which causes, it's causing a heart attack, just causing heart muscle to die. If you can get to the hospital quickly and you can get to the laboratory quickly and they can insert the catheter and, and uh, put in the catheter blood clot dissolving mixtures, what happens is they can dissolve the clots and they can open up the arteries and they can save some muscle and maybe reduce the risk of dying and reduce the risk of having a weak muscle. But the, the assessment of this uh, emergency is that you have to have it done quickly. The sooner the better. 90 minutes is usually the, the time limit given, but certainly it has to be done within six hours. After six hours, the heart muscle is dead. The clot is, is, is fully organized. It's not gonna dissolve easily. What we've been talking about in the previous studies is people that are beyond six hours, people who have chronic coronary artery disease, which is most of the angioplasties that are done. Let's talk about open heart surgery, coronary artery bypass surgery, we call it the cabbage. And this is where they uh, cut a hole in your chest and expose your heart to stale operating room air. And they operate on various arteries that show blockage and they take graphs from usually the veins in the leg, but these days often from arteries in different parts of the body, like in the arm, and they, they use these to bypass uh, the lesions. The lesions, remember, are hard, fibrous, non-lethal plaques. And we'll look at the results of uh, three studies that have been done. There have only been three studies done that show whether or not this is beneficial to go through this procedure. And you'll also hear even though the studies show no benefit, you'll see, you'll hear from doctors that, well, there is benefit in uh, treating one of the biggest blood vessels in the heart, which is the left main coronary artery. Well, that's not exactly true. Uh, if you look at the three studies done, and again, there are only three studies, what you show is there is essentially no benefit from doing the surgery in terms of staying alive. You have the veteran study, the European study, and the CAS study. At great financial cost, pain and suffering for the patient, and a risk of complications and death. Now, if you want to take the trouble to look these studies up, I've cited them for you here, and I give you the conclusions. The conclusions, conclusions are, is these procedures don't work on chronic coronary artery disease. And as far as the excuse that uh, the left main coronary artery, you know, that big trunk has to be bypassed because they call that the widow maker. Well, that's only if you have damage to the ventricle or do you see benefits. In other words, it's highly questionable whether they save lives even for this, this big blockage. I leave it up to you to look at the studies. One of the more concerning complications uh, from uh, having coronary artery bypass surgery, uh, specifically when people are attached to the heart lung machine, is embolization that occurs throughout the body. Uh, here's a picture of the retina of the eye. This is a place where you can see the blood vessels. The, the doctors peer into the eye and look at the back of the eye, and this is the fundus. And the first picture, what you see is the, uh, the vasculature before the surgery starts, before the patient is put on the heart lung machine. And the arrows point to various, uh, various areas of the artery and then the surgery is started. And you can actually put a stethoscope over the, over the carotid arteries and you can hear the debris that is, uh, that is coming from the heart lung machine and embolizing throughout the body. In this case, you see where emboli have stuck in the blood vessels and cause blockage. And what gets blocked dies. 
And so you have this diffuse embolization, you know, here they show the lesions uh, five days afterwards through a, a different kind of picture. Well, you know, the heart-lung machine is, is, a, is a medical miracle. I mean, when it's used in situations where you have no choice, you know, like uh, congenital heart disease, you know, children who have these defects, uh, you know, then it is a plain and simple miracle, even though there are significant risks. But what if you use it in people who have no advantage in terms of survival? And I just showed you the three major studies. There's no advantage in terms of survival from doing this procedure. Then you have only the complications that count. Now, what happens is the, the way you get this diffuse embolization is the blood is taken from one part of the heart and it's put through this machine which is a pump, which has membranes that put oxygen back into the blood and take carbon dioxide and other waste out of the blood system. And then what happens is the blood is dumped back into the patient. Well, in the process of going through the pump, what happens is bubbles are introduced into the circulation, some of them toxic gases. The blood cells are treated roughly and as a result, they form clumps little plastic parts break out of the membranes and break off the tubing. And they are dumped back into the patient. You have this diffuse embolization throughout the body. Now, when you embolize a artery or arterial, what happens when it lies distal dies. Now, a lot of tissues can regenerate like your liver and your skeletal muscle, but your brain can't. You know, once it's died, the tissue is dead. There are also major strokes that occur as a consequence of being going through this surgery. But what we're talking about is, is not a stroke. We're talking about something that happens. How often does it happen? Well, essentially in 100% of patients. How often is it of significance? Well, uh, this uh, particular study, what they did is they did um, MRIs of the brain right after the surgery and they found 51% of people, you could see the damage through a relatively crude technique technology. And then in another study, they looked at people five years after they'd had open heart surgery and had been on the heart lung machine and they found a 20% decline in their mental function in 42% of the patients. Let's talk about some uh, unfortunate circumstances, and that is that people die as a consequence of undergoing this surgery. Remember, a surgery that does not, does not prolong life based on the three major studies. And I give as the most tragic example, Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon. Heart surgeons killed him. Neil Armstrong went for a routine examination, no chest pain, no symptoms. And part of that routine examination just after his 82nd birthday is he got on a treadmill and he flunked the treadmill. And uh, as a result, they declared that he needed to have open heart surgery. Well, first of all, he didn't have the indications for having open heart surgery. He had no symptoms, no chest pain. That's one indication. The other indication would be theoretically to save your life. And as I showed you, the studies don't say that you're, don't show that you're gonna live longer undergoing these procedures. Studies of thousands of people, all the studies done. Well, the treadmill is a conveyor belt to the operating room. And so it was with Neil Armstrong. And they didn't stop to think that uh, when you're 80 years old, you have a very high risk of dying during this procedure. So the first man on the moon, he took one giant leap for mankind, but unfortunately he was sent to the world beyond by heart surgeons, aggressively trying to do good. So uh, why does heart surgery fail? I I'm talking about angioplasty, and this is a review, and, uh, and coronary artery bypass surgery where they put in the grafts. Why does, it fail? why does it fail? It fails because what they're treating is non-lethal scars, which never kill. These are hard fibrous plaques. These represent the disease that has occurred decades before. The disease that kills are fresh, 
volatile plaques that rupture. Now they're tiny, these volatile plaques that rupture. The hard fibrous plaques are easy to see by our technology and they're easy to treat by angioplasty or by bypassing these blockages. But the tiny pustules are hard to see and we have no treatments for them other than diet. The motivation is money, folks. The motivation is money, the patient be damned. Money, <laughs> let's talk about money. Uh, I used to work at uh, St. Lita Hospital, which at that time was the second uh, best cardiac surgery unit in the whole state of California. That's what the reputation was. 80% of their income came from heart disease and so does the income from your community hospitals, your major universities that perform cardiac surgery. 80% of their income comes from heart disease. And heart disease pays, the treatment pays. Open heart surgery can cost as much as $200,000 and angioplasty on average is $30,000. Now, if you wanna have a good review of what I just talked to you about, uh, go to the internet and look up a, a, a documentary that was done called The Widowmaker. And in this documentary, they talk to people on both sides of the table, the surgeons that uh, perform the procedures and also angioplasty we're talking about, and also those who are uh, critical of the procedure. And pretty much everybody agrees. These procedures do not save lives. And that's, that's the experts telling you this. Now, what they fail to tell you in The Widowmaker, this documentary, is they fail to tell you about the cure and the cure is changing your diet. But if you wanna see whether or not I'm exaggerating when I tell you that heart surgery doesn't save lives because they're treating old, hard, fibrous, non-lethal plaques, watch this documentary. So, <clears throat> You must hear the truth. Uh, diet does stop chest pain and cures the arteries. Now, after you, you find out you're not gonna be saved by the medical business, you get real desperate and you go to the last corner in town, which is uh, what we teach. That is that you have to take responsibility for yourself. You have to change your diet. And the diet that uh, cures heart disease and improves circulation is a low fat starch based diet. A low fat diet stops closure of the arteries by healing the disease and stabilizes the volatile plaques, the ones that rupture and form clots. So if you take a look at, uh, at arteries, uh, as time goes on, and that's what you see here on the left-hand side, uh, they can become progressively closed. But part of this artery closure involves pustules, pustules that can rupture. They rupture like a pimple rupturing on a teenager's face. And the rupturing releases products of injury which cause the blood to clot. Here we have uh, another representation of the progression. You start out with a healthy artery, which has a one cell layer that separates the blood from the tissues. It's called the intima. And this gets damaged by an uncontrolled fork and spoon that shovels globs of fat and slivers the cholesterol into the artery walls. And as a result of this damage, you get inflammation, swelling, heat, pain if there are, if there are nerves to the arteries. And uh, eventually what happens is a pustule material forms in this area. Well, some of these pustules, little pimples on the inside of your artery, uh, they develop a thin cap. And as a result, they rupture. And it's the process of rupturing that releases products of injury that cause a blood clot to form. And it's the blood clot that finishes your system off, that kills the tissues. That's why, that's why heart attacks are sudden. You know, you're well one minute and the next minute you're having severe chest pain and you're dying or dead. It's because of the sudden formation of a blood clot secondary to the rupture of a volatile pimple. And these are present throughout your artery system. I wrote about this in a book I published in 1996. I showed you the illustrations. What happens is you have a small, very tiny pustule 
and it develops a little crack, which we call a fissure, and then the plaque ruptures and the inner contents of semi-liquid necrotic material come spurting out in the bloodstream, like a pimple rupturing on a teenager's face. And this act of rupture causes the blood to clot and the tissue that lies distal dies. Here, let's, let's take a look at it in cell with some motion. You have the development of, a, of, of plaque and some of it's hard fibrous material. Other is, uh, is the, the pustular material. And eventually what happens is, uh, and, and the person feels perfectly well. There are no symptoms at all. What happens is one of these pimples pops and the circulation is stopped by a blood clot by small, largely unseen, by angiograms or CT scans. You know, doctors, if they could, if they could find and treat these tiny pustules, which are the lethal lesions, they would. But right now they can't, and I doubt that they ever will. Right now what they can find is old, fibrous, non-lethal scars, and that's where the business is directed to. Okay, a low-fat diet stops chest pain. Now, one of the reasons to have heart surgery because it doesn't save lives, is incapacitating chest pain. Well, you know, we have drugs uh, that uh, help with the chest pain like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers and nitroglycerin. That's a classic drug used with people who have angina. But the, uh, the most effective way of treating chest pain is rarely if ever utilized. When I say rarely, it's utilized in my practice, but otherwise it's not. Uh, what happens is what you eat causes your blood to become compromised. What it does is when you eat a fatty meal, it causes the blood cells to stick together. You see, blood cells, they naturally repel each other. They, they have negatively charged uh, membranes so that when they hit, they bounce off each other. And as a result, you have easy flow, good flow. But when you eat a high fat meal, I'm talking about vegetable fat or animal fat, what happens is the cells get coated with the fat and they no longer repel each other. They stick together. And you can see this, you can see the compromise in circulation by checking the oxygen. And the oxygen in the blood after a single high fat meal drops by 20%, which of course would bring on chest pain. By reducing the oxygen that goes to your heart and by reducing the circulation that goes to your heart. Uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, this is a, uh, a dramatic representation. It happens to be done in animal tissues and it was done by my friend, my friend Roy Swank. And you see the, the rapid flow of blood prior to any high fat meal. And uh, then they feed fat in this case to uh, an animal and the fat coats the cells and see how they stick together and the circulation slows. We call this rouleau formation. And it happens throughout the body in the, in the heart arteries and the brain arteries and all over the body it happens. And uh, finally, after about, uh, about 10 hours, finally the, the circulation breaks up and you start to get flow again. But uh, you know, in the meantime, for that period of time after you eat until the until the system gets its circulation back, you're compromised. Uh, this was also done in people. It was studied by, by many researchers in, 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 in live subjects and people. This, in this case, it's a 44 year old fireman. And the way they looked at the circulation is they looked at the whites of the eyes, which is called the conjunctiva. And they looked at it through a microscope and you see the picture on the left-hand side, you see really good circulation and uh, good blood flow, lots of, lots of blood vessels. And then what they did is they fed this 44 year old fireman one meal that contained 67% of the calories as fat. Well, let's look at the meal. He had two eggs, four strips of bacon, cream, bread, two pats of butter. I mean, how many of you eaten that meal? I certainly did in my youth. Well, after this one meal, they took another picture of the same area of the eye and you see a dramatic reduction in circulation. And as I told you, you can measure a 20% reduction in oxygen content of the blood, secondary to one high fat meal. And ladies and gentlemen, vegetable fat causes more severe and prolonged sludging than does animal fat. 
Now, you want to look at the research done? Well, here it is. Multiple studies done in the 50s and 60s and one of them in the 70s show what I just told you. Well, why don't you hear about these studies today? Why don't you hear about feeding a low-fat diet to stop angina today? How are you going to make the money? Where's the profit? You can look these studies up. You can see what I'm telling you is the truth, and it's been documented by many researchers, but it's never used, except in my practice, to treat people with compromised arteries. The last study uh, published on uh, treating people who have angina was done by my friend, Dr. Dean Ornish. And he published this in 1983. And he took a group of people and he put them in a setting where he could feed them a low fat diet, uh, like the diet that I encourage you to eat. And in 24 days, they had a 91% reduction in frequency of chest pain episodes. Why aren't they doing these studies over and over again? Show me the money. All right, how about the underlying disease? Can you stop the underlying disease? You may ask yourself, can you, can you reverse atherosclerosis? Well, yes, you can, but not the scars. I mean, the scars stay, but they're old scars. It's like when you fell off your bicycle and you landed on your forehead, you, you got a, a, a laceration and eventually it healed as a scar. And next time you fell on your forehead, where did it break? Not in the area of the scar, but someplace else. Scars are solid and they don't cause any problem unless they significantly block the, the arteries, which they do on rare occasions. But there's a whole nother part of this blockage that can be reversed. Uh, it, it's the, uh, the volatile plaques that are inflamed and the swelling that occurs. You can actually reverse the, the artery disease, but the way you have to do it is you have to stop the repetitive injury to the arteries. You see, the arteries are trying to heal. Your body never stops healing. You have this innate ability to heal. You know this, you, you know this because of other circumstances in your life. For example, if you get in an, in an accident, you fall off your bicycle, you get a laceration, you get a broken bone. You don't have to ask whether or not your bones and your skin are gonna heal. You know they're gonna heal. You know, in, in three weeks, the, the wounds are knitted together pretty good. The bones are knitted together enough for you to be walking around on crutches. Three months later, you're out there back on your bicycle. You didn't have to do anything special. You didn't have to take any medicine or say any chants or prayers. The body has an innate ability to heal. Of course, the, it can't catch up with the damage. That's the problem. You know, just like, for example, the cigarette smoker, they continue to have progressive cough and sputum and difficulty breathing until they stop the source of injury. And then what happens? They stop coughing. The lung function comes back. Oh, there may be some residual scar tissue there, but hopefully not for most of us. The uh, first evidence that you could heal this disease was performed by Walter Kempner at Duke University back in the 1940s. What he showed was that uh, you could reverse artery disease based on electrocardiogram. They didn't have angiograms. They didn't have uh, CAT scans back then. So they had to rely upon an, a technology which is called an electrocardiogram. Now, the sign of of, of compromised circulation of the heart is a segment of the electrocardiogram becomes depressed. This is called the ST segment. It follows the big spike. You see the depression there following the spike on the left-hand side of the EKG. And normal is when the ST segment is not depressed. Well, you know, Walter Kempner took his patients with coronary artery disease and he did electrocardiograms on them. And then he put them on the rice diet, which we're gonna talk about extensively in one of our future lectures, but it's a diet of rice, fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar. And what he showed is reversal of artery disease. Well, you can see the, the ST segments have become upright in this patient and most of his other patients based on electrocardiogram. 
Uh, Dean Ornish has done many studies, many studies. They don't not only show uh, lowering of cholesterol and triglycerides and getting rid of high blood pressure and solving your obesity problems and correcting insulin resistance and curing diabetes, but according to PET scans, 99% of patients stopped or reversed the progression of coronary artery disease. No, that's what Dean Arnish has shown. Uh, Caldwell Esselstyn, he did a different approach. Uh, he looked at uh, 200 patients with coronary artery disease and, and he showed by putting them on a diet that's almost exactly like the one that I teach and pretty close to the one that Dean Arnish teaches. Documented by, by angiograms, you show reversal of the disease. Remember, it's not the scar part that reverses, it's, it's the, the, the part that is uh, still involved with swelling and inflammation that you can reverse. And it's enough usually so that people stop having chest pain. And the most important thing is the sores, the postules, they stabilize and they heal by stopping the damage. Uh, here's one of my patients. Uh, he worked for the Attorney General of uh, the state of California, and he discovered me just on the internet. And 61 years old, he had high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, recurrent kidney stones. We well, had 250 pounds and I had a cholesterol of 294. Well, that was okay. I mean, he was still living. But then he started to have what he thought was indigestion, went to his family doctor. The doctor said, you know, this this, this chest pain you're having could be something else, could be more serious. It could be angina, which means that you have disease of your coronary arteries. So he was referred to a cardiologist. The cardiologist did a perfusion scan and the scan showed uh, mild to moderate perfusion defects along the inferior and lateral walls. Well, what do you think the cardiologist recommended? Of course, the heart surgery. Well, you know, Robert's job in his entire life was working for the Surgeon General, suing physicians. That was his job. So he was suspect of what goes on in the medical business. And he, he decided he was going to look into another way of dealing with his problems. And so this was January of 2008. Uh, in May of 2009, what we find is he has no angina. He's off all his medications for diabetes, high blood pressure, indigestion. He dropped his cholesterol 134 points and his bad cholesterol 150 points. He lost 60 pounds 16 months later. He went to his general doctor and he said, you know, you have to have this confirmed by the cardiologist. And the cardiologist took one look at Robert and said, I don't believe it. You can't reverse this disease. I know this. I'm the expert. I'm the cardiologist. And so Robert agreed to get another perfusion scan. And so he did. And you see the results here a reversal of the artery disease, healing of the arteries. And what did the cardiologist say? He said to Robert, they must have reversed the scans. Robert never went back. So there are reasons uh, to do heart surgery. The, the reason as stated to me as a medical student, still told to medical students today, is for relief of incapacity and chest pain, unrelieved by good medical therapy. Since these procedures don't save lives, and I've shown you this, I've shown you all the studies. There is another reason to have heart surgery, is to relieve incapacitating chest pain by good medical therapy. Well, good medical therapy should be starting out with anti-anginal drugs like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers and nitroglycerin. You know, that, that's what the doctor should be prescribed. But by reflex, doctors send the patients for cardiac surgery. Okay. They, they fail another uh, criterion and that's incapacity and chest pain. What's incapacity and chest pain? Say I got chest pain by walking my dog behind my house. That wouldn't be incapacitating because I really don't like walking the dog that much. I just stopped walking the dog. Well, what if I got chest pain and here's a picture of me on the North shore of Maui. Well, going 34 miles an hour on my windsurfer. And I couldn't do that anymore. I might consider this incapacitating. What would I do? 
well, I, I might get a uh, angioplasty done and, and maybe I'd get a bare metal stent done, but I don't think I'd get a drug eluding stent done. And I'd definitely quit windsurfing uh, if they only offered me open heart surgery with the associated brain damage. You know, think about it in your life when you are threatened with uh, these kinds of aggressive treatments. Is it really incapacitating chest pain? Have they tried good medical therapy with you? No, they haven't. I assure you they haven't, even if they've pushed a few drugs on you. They haven't tried good medical therapy. <clears throat> I showed you that good medical therapy is improving the circulation by changing to a low fat diet. I've showed you the studies, you can look them up. So uh, how do you reverse this disease? Well, you reverse it by first identifying the cause and people say this is a result of modern living. No, it's not, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you look at, uh, at autopsies of mummies uh, buried in their pyramids uh, three, 4,000 years ago, and they do autopsy on them, or these days they do CAT scans on their bodies, what you find is the extensive atherosclerosis in the kings and queens, the priests and priestesses. In, in fact, one major study, what they showed when they could identify artery parts is that half of them had evidence of atherosclerosis in their heart arteries, their leg arteries, and their brain arteries, and so on. The kings and queens and aristocrats, uh, they ate the rich food. There's even stories about how the priests would eat the offerings that were put on the statues. And sometimes they didn't even take the offerings home to their family before the ceremonies and eat them all kinds of, uh, of diseases of eating rich food are, are present three, 4,000 years ago. Now people didn't smoke then. They got lots of exercise and plenty of sunshine. The only thing that was different was the food that they ate. The people who built the pyramids lived on starch-based diets. And so it is with other times in history, you know the classic story of kings and queens, of aristocrats, they ate the rich food. You know, the, the starches were grown by the farm workers, the, the corn and the beans and the rice and the potatoes. And that was the diet of the, of the workers. Uh, but what uh, the aristocrats decided that they were going to do is they weren't going to eat this plant food directly. They were going to filter it through sheep and cows and pigs first, and then they'd eat those animals. And you know this, you know this, rich foods make people sick. They have then, they do now. The difference between then and now is that then there are only a few aristocrats. So now half the population of planet earth eats like kings and queens, Dairy Queen, Burger King, Imperial Margarine, they don't even disguise it. So by, by wealth, people end up eating the rich American diet but also by necessity of environments. For example, the Inuit Eskimo. If uh, you take a look at autopsies done on Inuit Eskimos, in this particular case, what they're looking at is two women who were buried under an ice flow five centuries ago. One was estimated to be in her 20s, the other in her 40s. And uh, what they found was they found that they had extensive atherosclerosis and severe osteoporosis from their diet of fish and mammals, you know, whales and seals and so on. They didn't smoke. You know, they, they had lots of stresses in their lives, but that wasn't the cause. The cause was the diet in uh, rich in animal foods. It's, it, it's been happening throughout history because that's not our diet. And as a result, we're malnourished and our body falls apart in so many different ways. Now, when you go about trying to solve your health problems, you might think, well, I'm gonna try something easy. I'm gonna try a low carb diet, you know, an Atkins-like diet, lots of meat and things that I really love. You don't really love these things. You can't eat them without covering them with salt and sauces. Well, there've been four major studies related to heart disease, looking at low carbohydrate diets. And all, no other studies, there no, there, this is it folks, you can look them up. Four major studies show that eating these kinds of diets increases your risk of dying 
and dying of heart disease. So that's not how you want to approach the problem. The way you want to approach the problem is eating the diet designed for human beings, which is a starch-based diet. You know, like the, the people of Central America you used to eat, the Incas and the Mayans, people of the corn, or the people of the Andes, the Incas who lived on potatoes and quinoa, or the people from the Middle East, Egypt, Iran, Iraq. That was known as the breadbasket of the world. They ate bread, wheat, and barley. Or when you think of the, 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 the places of Asia, what do you think about it? people, but Asians eating? Their diet's rice. Up until 1980, when they started watching CNN news and learned about the American way. And now, of course, people in China are developing obesity and diabetes at a similar rate to what we have in the United States. That's the diet that you need to eat, eat is uh, the diet for human beings, the ones that we've eaten through most of our existence of maybe 750,000 years we've been on this planet as, as homo sapiens. Yeah, you pick the time with it. You know, that's, that's been the diet of people. This, this, this modern Western diet is just a blip in history. It's, it's only been popular over the last 50 to 100 years, and it's killing us and the planet, much less the animals. Now, in addition to dietary change, uh, I also prescribe some medication. Uh, the medications are of some benefit in people who are really sick. Yeah, not, not in people who don't have symptoms of heart disease, not in people who haven't had a heart attack or a stroke or heart surgery. There's no benefit there, no reasonable benefit of taking statin drugs. It's only in people who've already, had, already declared themselves as being sick, have already been in trouble. Then there's a tiny benefit for primary prevention, which is in people who have no known disease, 98% of people saw no benefit. Whereas those who had already had a heart attack or heart surgery, in other words, it's a secondary prevention. The results were statistically significant, yes. In this case, 96% showed no benefit and only 4% showed benefit. Not much folks, these, these medications are oversold to you. They're not the answer to the problem because they're not the cause of the problem but they're very profitable. Also aspirin, aspirin uh, helps, uh, helps the clot from forming, you know, it thins the blood. And so when a plaque ruptures, if you have aspirin on board, it's less likely to form a clot which closes off the artery, which kills the heart muscle and often the patient. But as you heard uh, October of 2021, the news, the headline news was that aspirin should not be used in the general population. Only in people who are severely ill does it show benefits. I, I was writing about this uh, back in 2010. I, I was telling you about the limits of, uh, of statin drugs in an article I wrote in 2013. This is old information, but it just doesn't get popular. Why? You know why? There's no profit. So my approach to heart disease is to heal the arteries, open the lumen, stop the chest pain, prevent a heart attack, get rid of the, the, the volatile rupture plaques, the pimples that line the arteries and, and to keep you alive. And so how do I approach my patients who have heart disease? Well, strict diet, and we teach this. We teach this now by a telemedicine, telehealth program that I encourage you to look into. And I give su sufficient statin medication to reduce the cholesterol to 150 milligrams per deciliter or less. And I'll give a baby aspirin, but only to people who have declared themselves as being ill. And maybe these medications do a little bit of good, but I, you know, I'm not gonna throw the baby out with the wash water. I'm a trained medical doctor. You know, I, I've learned these things about the benefits and risks of medications and treatments. And, you know, I'm going to offer patients the advantage of what I learned through my traditional medical training as a board certified internist who's taken care of over 12,000 patients over the last half a century. Yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to deprive you of what I consider good medical care. If it works, it works. But I also know about the food. 
That's what I've studied for 44 years is the food. Diet therapy is caused. And I'm gonna prescribe this for you because that's where the benefit is. It's in fixing the cause. Uh, there are uh, several books uh, that I've written about heart disease and I encourage you to have these books. In fact, I encourage you so much to have these books that uh, I've made them available to you free. No gimmicks, you, you just go to our website. Uh, the two books uh, that are available to deal with heart disease are the McDougall Program for a Healthy Heart, free. And McDougall's Medicine, a Challenging Second Opinion, free. Also, because I gave the talk on breast cancer recently, I, I also provided the book for you I wrote called The McDougall Program for Women Free. And I encourage you to download these files and share them with your friends and relatives and medical doctors. And you tell them this is a challenging second opinion. And if you have any disagreement with what Dr. McDougall says, you think he's out of date. You think there's better ways. There's, uh, there's research that I've missed. You tell them what my, what my email address is. I'll be glad to, to go over the scientific literature with them. Yeah, I wrote these, these books a while ago. Sure I did, but I keep up with the scientific literature. And you know, I got it right the first time. I worked really hard to make sure that I understood what was going on and I cited properly the scientific research that supports it. In other words, folks, not only is the truth simple and easy to understand, the truth don't change. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I've certainly enjoyed giving it to you. That was great, Dr. McDougall. It's so, you're such a good lecturer. <laughs> well, it's a passion and there's a reason it's a passion is because not only do I believe it, but I love, I love being a doctor. I love my work. And it's really easy to spend uh, 12, 14, 16 hours a day doing something you love. Uh, it's not work for me, it's my life. And uh, those of you who have been exposed to my work, you know how hard I've tried to get things right. And you know also that I'm open to making modifications if not modifications need to be made. Um, but you know, so far I said it right the first time. And not only do we have the books, uh, many of them you can buy, uh, they're still uh, national bestsellers for many of the book companies out there. But the books that I own the titles to, I've given you three of them, I'll give you three more, free. Because I want you to know this. I want you to have available the scientific research and it's all there. You know, you, you can, as I do, you can go back to the National Library of Medicine. You can listen to the news. You can look about at, at the new studies done, et cetera, et cetera. You know what? They don't add much, certainly nothing important enough to change my recommendations to the science that's been established over a hundred years of research by scientists who really wanted to know. You know, as of 1980, when the government stopped funding basic scientific research during deregulation, universities, laboratories had to look for other sources of funding. And so they looked to industry. Since 1980, 70% of the research on drugs, devices, and food has been paid for by the representative companies. And what do you think these researchers are going to show if they expect to get future funding? You know, you can trust research published before 1980. Yeah, because these were dedicated doctors, scientists who really wanted to know the truth. After 1980, you better be suspect. You better look at the funding source before you read the paper. I do. I do, and I'm rarely surprised as to what I'm going to find in the scientific paper. Yep, you can buy scientists pretty cheaply. Dr. McDougall, there's some really nice comments in the chat, like the truth don't change. Thank you for sharing this information. Dr. McDougall, you're a badass. That's a compliment, by the way. And Barbara wants to know, would you ever share your slides, your slide deck? Uh, sure, you can watch it on video anytime you want. No, I won't. Okay, great. Because, because, and I've been asked this for my whole career, you know, because uh, I'm, I'm afraid people will, will 
give another story associated with the slides. Now, if you show the slides, you've got to hear my words, my thoughts, or at least people will know that they came from that kind of source. Uh, I can't, uh, you can make them up yourself if you want. What I showed is easy to find on the internet. You know, I've given you the papers, you can look them up. You can, you can read the papers, you can come to your own conclusions. You can make up your own slides. Uh, I encourage you to do it, go out and tell the story. But you know, what I've done is taken a lot of work and I, I just don't want to be misrepresented. That's, that's basically it. Yeah. What's the video? The video will be up free, hopefully edited. <laughs> I'll give uh, Charles a few days, but yes, it will definitely be up uh, immediately right, after okay. the we'll, show. We'll, Can we put the unedited version up? Uh, yeah, we'll put the un unedited. We always put the unedited up immediately, yeah. and then we edit the actual presentation. Yeah. So please give them a few days, but absolutely. Yeah. Now, we have questions, as you know. There are many that have been right. submitted in advance and many in the chat. Did you want to bring Mary on yet? I, I, I do. What, what day was your 50th wedding anniversary? I'm sorry, I missed it. I would have sent a gift. Yeah, it was January 8th. Wow. I'm, I'm, really pretty, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure Mary might correct us, but uh, I think it was January. It was January 8th. Yeah, we met, uh, we met 51 years ago. Yeah, or, yeah, 51 years ago, we've been married 50 years. You know, as I started this presentation, I started to tell you is that it was love at first sight, at least from my point of view. I think it took Mary a few months, if not years, to fall in love with me. But you know, it was it was love at first sight. I, I knew she was the right one, and you know, we've had a lot of a lot of bumps in our marriage. It's not it's not been all a free ride, just like with most of you. But you know, we started out with a couple of people who really wanted to enjoy life and had principles, and and uh, as a result, we raised uh, three amazing children. Uh, who are uh, who are uh, who contribute to uh, to society in a very positive way? Uh, we you have Heather who now runs the entire McDougal program, and she's near fifty. Scary. <laughs> oh. And, and my son Craig, who is a professor, full professor at Oregon Health and Science University, one of the best universities in the world. And then my other son, who's uh, who, who's a chemist. And he works for uh, a subsidiary of one of the oil companies. You know, not my first choice, but that's what he does. <laughs> and he has his PhD in chemistry and did uh, postdoctorate studies that, uh, that were really amazing at Stanford University. He's an extremely well-educated, very productive young man. So you know, it's not that we were lucky. You know, Mary and I put a lot of work into our kids. We've got seven grandkids that we believe will turn out to be just as productive individuals for society because their parents likewise are, are working hard to teach the kids uh, morals and good education, you know, so that they have a chance in life. And it's not that these kids don't have the potential to do bad. That's what I <laughs> often say, particularly about two of them, is they are huge high energy. They can go in a very bad direction or a very good direction. And it's up to us, parents and grandparents, to hit them in the right direction because they, they're just a couple of them. Well, all of them are amazing kids, but these two individuals, whoa, you better, you better watch them. You know, they, they, they have no limits. Hey, Mary. Hi. Good to see you here. We're, we're just answering some questions. And so I really like to give people that wrote them in an advance uh, priority. It's just that what I'm seeing in the chat is something <coughs> was coming up yesterday. So I don't know if you want to address this now or wait till you do a lecture more on fat, but that dreaded olive oil keeps oh, coming yeah. up because uh -huh. there's, there's some research, there are some research, you know, you say the truth never changes and I agree with you, but it seems that the research changes and people are referring to some research about how a teaspoon or a tablespoon of olive oil every day is going to help you live longer. Yeah. I I've, I've casually looked at the studies you're talking about and, uh, there, there are confounding factors involved. In other words, people who add olive oil to their diet, you know, we think of the Mediterranean diet, also eat very high vegetable diets. You know, the, the Mediterranean diet is healthy in spite of the olive oil, not because of it. It's because it's a diet high in starches, vegetables, and fruits. And there are other lifestyle factors involved in people who eat the Mediterranean diet. 
you know, I, I have uh, plenty of evidence that uh, olive oil is just like other oils. And that is the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And I can't think of anything particularly attractive about wearing olive fat as opposed to pig fat. It might smell better, but it's just as, uh, it's just as detracting from your appearance as uh, in fact, many sources. We know this because, you know, research, and I, and I, gave, I gave this research, and like I did in this lecture, I provided for you the, the scientific articles to show it, you know, that show that the fat you eat is the fat you wear. You can biopsy people's body fats, their abdomen, thigh, buttocks, suck the fat out with a needle, take it to a lab, and you can see what they like to eat. For example, if they like uh, cold water marine fish, or they take supplements of omega-3s, their body fat will be full of omega-3 fats. You can see that in the laboratory analysis. If they're into Criscos and margarines, they'll be full of trans fats. If they're into olive oil, they'll be full of monounsaturated fats. If they like animal products, particularly dairy, they'll be full of what we call C15, C17 fats. That's where the double bonds appear in the fats that are dominant in animal foods at carbon 15 and carbon 17. So the fat you eat, the fat you wear, ladies and gentlemen, from your lips to your hips, that's where that olive oil is gonna go. Uh, there's also good research that says that olive oil uh, does not promote healthy arteries. And uh, you know, I can present that for you someday. Uh, some of it's done by Blank and David Blankenhorn from UCLA where he looked at uh, reversal of artery disease. I should have added David Blankenhorn in his work, which is some of the earlier work on reversal of artery disease to my discussion. But David Blankenhorn, when he, uh, he analyzed his uh, patients and looked at whether or not they reversed artery disease, it was those that reversed, that reduced total fat intake. He didn't see any particular benefit from polyunsaturated or monounsaturated reductions in fat or an increase in animal fat. He's, it was total in fat that made a difference. You know, a lot of people don't like me talking about animal studies, but there are animal studies on rhesus monkeys that show olive oil promotes atherosclerosis. You know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of evidence that ought to make you question this kind of advice, which is based upon observational studies, which have confounding factors, like I said, the Mediterranean diet is healthy in spite of the olive oil, not because of it. Wouldn't you also want to look at who did the study and who paid for it? Yeah, of course you would. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, I, I haven't looked at that. I've, I've not looked at the, the, the particular papers you're talking about carefully, but you know, I, I've got a, a general overview of them. And you know, I, I can, people love to support their own personal views, and, and I'm no exception. And they support their own diet and their own lifestyle. It's hard for us to see beyond our own dinner table. So one of the things I would ask in those who promote olive oil is, what do you eat? You know, what do you eat yourself? You know, I, I bet they include lots of olive oil in their diet, and lots of olives, I bet. I don't know for sure, but I bet. So anyway, the other thing that we're dealing with is we're dealing with a whole generation of uh, new experts who uh, you know, make comments about Dean Ornish and myself and Neil Bernard and Dr. Esselstyn. You know, people have been at this for more than 40 years we've been doing this. People have done basic research. I looked at other people's research, but we've done our own research and published it. And what they're, they're looking to do is to somehow elevate themselves to our status. Well, I'm not going to give you a stage until you deserve it. You know, do the research, spend the time. Don't go just tell me about a couple of papers you happen to enjoy because it supports your eating of olive oil. Hey, you're getting me carried away on something I didn't want to get carried away on. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll go, to, we'll go back to heart disease because there have been some questions submitted like this one from Jane. It's about aortic thoracic aneurysm. I discovered an aortic ascending thoracic aneurysm during a CT scan in 2016. I suspect it developed in conjunction with PMR, which I had from 212 to 217 and I took prednisone for. 
uh, um, so she's giving a lot of medical history about this, but she basically says, I never had any symptoms. I eat a low fat diet of starches, vegetables, fruit, as you recommend, don't take any medication. Is there anything I can do to make it shrink or go away? And is there any other way to measure it other than a CT scan? Uh, the answer is no and yes. Uh, you, you can't go make it go away. This is a, a permanent structural change in the integrity of your artery walls of your aorta. Uh, it may have been consequence of your autoimmune disease where your own body attacked the, the arteries. But most commonly what it's due to is poor circulation to, to the blood vessel. I mean, the, the aorta is a big blood vessel. It's like huge, like this big. It has a thick wall. And for it to, be, it to be nourished, that wall to be nourished, it has to have its own separate circulation. It's called the vasovasorum. And so what you have is you have arteries coursing the outside surface of the aorta and they dive into the muscle and into the inner layers of the, of the aorta. And when these blood vessels get diseased, these ones that feed the aorta, because the aorta doesn't get its blood supply, its oxygen, its nutrients, from the blood that's flowing through it. It's just too thick instead of its own blood supply. What happens is when the arteries gets compromised, uh, the, the aorta becomes weakened and, and it, it uh, bulges out like, a, like an inner tube. You know, you know, the bulge of an inner tube and, and it can rupture inside, like in John Ritter's case, the TV star, or it can rupture outside now, what standard measurements are, and this person knows this, is it, when you do an echocardiogram, and you can do other, I mean, there's other ways to measure it. Echocardiograms are safe, no radiation. That's a way to measure it. I mean, they can see it with a CT scan or an MRI probably too. Echocardiogram is the way they, they measure, or an echogram, not an echocardiogram, it's an echogram, sound waves. If it is uh, bigger than five centimeters, it's uh, declared to be of risk but less than five centimeters, uh, doctors don't wanna operate on it. It's a life-saving procedure to have it operated on before it ruptures. I have been in on you know, too many surgeries where we took a, a, uh, a graph, you know, basically made of a plastic material and we replaced a disease section of the aorta and saved the person's life. And there's some good things in modern medicine. You don't wanna throw the baby out of the wash water but you know, in your case, I think you need to rely upon your experts. Uh, you, know, you of course you can look up their their recommendations. You can read the science, basic scientific research. In this day and age, it's all available to you. It's just a you know, type in a couple of buttons on your keyboard. It's right there. You know, you do as much if you were buying a car, wouldn't you? you'd study whether or not it is a good car before you bought it. Why don't you study whether or not the recommendations for your doctors are worthwhile? Oh, doctor, you're next to God. I believe you, I'll do anything you say. That's what, that's what, that was what we were taught. Get over it, get over, get over it because it's not good for you and it's not good for your doctor. You know, if a doctor puts himself up on a pedestal and supposed to deliver perfect, perfect outcomes, operations, perfect babies. What happens when a doctor fails to deliver perfect? And this is next to God, what happens? You go see your lawyer and you sue the doctor for not being perfect. Well, you know, if you wouldn't have set this person up on such a high pedestal and you would make them just a, a reasonable, hardworking professional like you should look at them, and of course, question them all the way. Then we, neither the doctor or the patient would be at risk for, for such tragic outcomes. So didn't she also want to know whether she could shrink it? Oh, no, you can't know. It's, it's, it, yeah, that was the no. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, okay. you know, it's, it's a permanent structural damage. You can't. But remember, that's compromise of the, of the aorta, the muscle wall, because the vasovasorum, the little blood vessels that feed it, are diseased. Well, I just showed you how you can improve the circulation. You know, stop the blood sludge you already have, I know, but you can improve the circulation, how you can improve the oxygen delivery by 20% with the choice of one healthy meal. 
or really I should say it the other way, the choice of one unhealthy meal causes the reduction of oxygen in the blood by 20%. And, and you've corrected the, the, the problem, the disease does not progress. You know, just like, just like I told you, when I was a young man, many of you know, I, I ate with enthusiasm the rich American diet. You know, I was raised by parents who went through the depression, had to live up on potatoes and turnips. And they promised that their children would never have to suffer like they did. And so my parents made sure I had the best nutrition. The best nutrition was taught by industry to be enough calcium, enough protein. That was for industry's benefit. There's no such thing as calcium or protein deficiency. Of course, my parents, like your parents, bought into it. And uh, we never had any risk of uh, developing protein or calcium deficiency. But I suffered, you know, I suffered a lot. I suffered as a child with stomach problems and lost my tonsils at age seven. And as a teenager, I had no endurance at all and I had a greasy, pimply face. At 18, I had a massive stroke, which uh, for the last, I don't know, what, 57 years or something, I've walked with a pretty significant limp. And my port jive on the windsurfer is horrible. <laughs> I make only half as many of those jives as I do in my, in my starboard tack, my tar starboard jive, because I'm weak on the left side. I can't fix that. But you know what? You know, even though I knew I had heavy, uh, serious heart disease, I had a cholesterol 338 when I was what, about 22 years old. At uh, about 28 years old, I had a heart scan. Mary had one too. We, my brother was working, my brother was a physician, an internist. <clears throat> He was working at a place where they had a, uh, a machine, a heart scanning machine. And so we both underwent heart scans and I'll never forget the day. The technician brought us in. She said, well, let's go over Mary's scan first. And uh, the, the technician said, you know, yours is perfect. No calcium at all. No sign of any chronic inflammation, which is what the calcium is. And then she says, now you. <laughs> And she says, you know, you got big trouble. And I did, I, I, I flunked the, the, the calcium score, it was high. I don't remember exactly how high it was, but it was high. Well, there was no surprise. I mean, remember, I had a stroke at 18. I remember what I ate. I, you know, I lived on meat and eggs and dairy and oil. Well, you could see your plaques too, right? When they show us Yeah, you the, could see the calcification. Yeah. They show them. I guess they were trying to scare me into doing something, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I'd already changed my diet. I, I wasn't really worried about. It. I was. This is in. I was in my probably my late twenties, early thirties, and I knew that I could stop the progression of this disease, and uh, I'm living proof. You know, I look. I look. I wasn't worried a bit. There was our old, hard, fibrous, calcified scars. I knew that. I just didn't want any new pimples, new pustules new volatile plaques that would rupture and cause a blood clot to form. And I have it, I don't plan on it. All my parts are working. All my parts, right, Mary? All of your parts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a great thing. So we've got a lot of questions on statins from actually three different people. So Janet wants to know how low your LDL has to be to get off of statins. Rochelle wants to know, is there an alternative to statins if you don't wanna take them? And John wanted to know if he should take them even though he has no chest pains, he's at a healthy weight, he's whole food plant-based since 2017, he's 74, walks for exercise, no cardiac events, but his total cholesterol is 236 and his LDL is 158. You'll probably have to repeat that one to me, but let's see if I can address the, the first uh, two. Uh, doctors say that you should lower your LDL bad cholesterol to 70 milligrams per deciliter. I, I think that's okay. You know, uh, I think total cholesterol is enough to know. You know, when I look back, I was probably the one that started the, uh, started the idea that an ideal cholesterol was 150 or less. I, d I did that, made those, uh, those declarations on my national tours for my books based upon the Framingham study. From Fam Framingham, Massachusetts, uh, they studied a large group of community-based people. And they found uh, that when people ran cholesterol less than 150, they didn't have heart disease. So I, I made that kind of a standard that's become very popular around the world. 
And uh, I think that's okay. You need to have uh, grades on your report card. Just like your report card, the A you got, it doesn't mean you learned the subject. You could have cheated. And taking statins is cheating. <laughs> you didn't fix the problem. So uh, anyway, you can use those particular milestones if you want to assess your progress. Uh, Dean Ornish's study, he, he didn't find a correlation between the reduction of cholesterol and to whether or not he saw reversal of artery disease. What he saw was a correlation with compliance to the program. That was the determining factor. And I'd have to agree, you know, cholesterol is just a number. Nobody dies of high <clears throat> cholesterol. What I'd be more important, what would be more important to me as an advisor to you was do you follow the diet right? Do you follow a starch-based diet with a few fruits and vegetables and no added oils and a whole food diet? Do you? I mean, really, do you? You know, that's what's going to make the difference. And, you know, I can get your cholesterol as low as you want. Before I tell you that, I want you to know cholesterol is used. It's a precursor. It's used by the body to make vitamin D and also sex hormones. Well, testosterone, progesterone, and cholesterol. It's a precursor. So you start lowering your cholesterol a lot. Guess what happens to your sex hormones? You can guess. Uh, so you don't want to be, be aggressive with medication. By the way, it never happens if you get a low cholesterol with diet. It only happens when you do it with drugs. Uh, so uh, you, you can use this as numbers if you want, but more important is how you follow the program. As far as an alternative, there's red yeast rice, which was taken off the market because they were sued by the people who made lovastatin because red yeast rice is lovastatin. That's, that's, where they, that's how they, in, they invented it, is they took it out of plants, uh, red yeast rice. And it was off the market for a long time. I think you can get it again now, but it's just like taking a statin. You know, I don't we, know used, to, we used to be able to buy it in bulk. Yeah. Remember from Earthseed? They yeah. had those big bins that were like huge um, half- a 50 gallon bins or oh. like the half half a wine barrel bin and Poison. they'd fill it up and good thing i didn't take that right my sex yeah. hormones have been gone. <laughs> um anyway that's uh there's there's gugu lipid also which is an indian type of herb which lowers cholesterol uh it, there's an article i wrote about cholesterol you go to my website you look under hot topics you look under the suggestion of things to read that i've written about cholesterol there's an article I wrote and it, it slips my mind because it was written 20 years ago. But it tells you the different quote, quote, natural medications that will lower your cholesterol. And one of the things I listed there was niacin. Well, niacin is quite toxic. In fact, it's been shown to increase the risk of stroke. So I don't recommend niacin, you know, which is a concentrated vitamin. So there's one thing you've changed. Yeah, there you go. But remember, I reserve the right to change my opinion about any kind of drug or or, yeah. uh, or you know, drug or device interference. I, I reserve the right to change that because the, the data is always changing and it's always incomplete. But for those of you waiting to change my, for me to change my advice about diet, forget it. Forget it, I'm not gonna change. Not because I'm stubborn, it's because I got it right the first time. You know, it's just, I work so hard took me six years to write my first book. And, you, you know, Mary will tell you, you know, that's six years of me being out of her life, pretty much. I spent day and night in the medical libraries and day and night uh, uh, sitting in front of my computer when I started writing books. I remember when you had one of the first computers and it cost like $5,000. $5, yeah. And he, he would sit in front of the computer and he would have Craig as a baby laying on his lap in front of the computer while he was writing this book. Craig's 38 now? Craig's 39. He 39. just turned 39. So I, I've been, you know, I, I really did work hard, ladies and gentlemen, and, and I know my work shows it. So I'm not in any way embarrassed about saying it. No, I, I got it right the first time. And if you can improve on what I, what I developed that many years ago, and, and based upon the work of so many geniuses, I've told you that, uh, you know, this is not original. 
my work is based upon eons of people, but particularly those who came just before me. Uh, they are uh, Dennis Burkett, which you can read about him in my January 2013 newsletter. Nathan Pritikin, which you can read about in my February 2013 newsletter. Walter Kempner, who you can read about in my December 2013 newsletter. And Roy Swank, the guy who was head of neurology for 23 years at Oregon Health and Science University, where my son is a professor, who is scattered throughout the, the website. Roy Swank, Roy Swank and I were, were good friends. In fact, he, he signed a, a document with me that I would take over his work on diet and multiple sclerosis. I, I still have that document. No, you don't. Yes, I did. Yeah. I know you think you got burned up in the fire. I got burned up. But I put sure. I, I, it's on my computer. It's a, I, I took a PDF of that uh, of that signed document. I have it, Mary. Okay. And uh, but thanks for mentioning it. We lost. I lost so much in the fire. No, pe people. You didn't lose what was important. Well, you know, I, in some sense, you're right. I got put the most important articles out, AJ. But it, I met Mary. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, AJ. <laughs> okay, I, I'll, I'll complete that sentence. But yeah, I, I, every day I, I go, oh, I'd like to pull that article out. And you knew just where it was. I know too. exactly where it is. I know which, which file cabinet. I know which folder. I know where it's at exactly, but it's gone. <laughs> and uh, that's okay. It, it really hasn't interfered with my ability to spread the good news. I, I still have enough information here and on my computer that I, I could still function. But, nice. you know, it was a lot of work. I used to, when I, during my medical residency at uh, the Queens Medical Center, I, I would, uh, after I finished my duties, I, you know, since I had to be out there all night taking care of patients, when I had free time, uh, I went to the medical library, which was on the same grounds as uh, as uh, the Queens Medical Center was the medical library. Uh, and I, I would sit there and I would do something that you can't do today, which is go through the Medicus Index, which was a series of books. You know, there must have been 60 books, which cross reference uh, the studies. So you'd look up diet and multiple sclerosis and it'd give you the researchers' papers that have been published on it. And then you go back to the stacks. And you'd look through the stacks and find that, that particular article. And if I couldn't find that article, I'd, I'd have the librarian go to the National Library and find me that article. And I did that. I did that for two and a half years. And if you go to the Queens Medical Center, it's not the, the Hawaii Medical Library anymore, but it was, and you'll, the building's still there, you'll, you'll see scars I left. What I, what I would do is because they charge for Xeroxing at the library, 10 cents a copy, but I had free Xeroxing copies. That was probably Xerox. I, uh, no, I think they had, a, uh, they had a regular copy machine then, but free, free copy machine over at the, uh, the Queens Medical Center I could use. And so what I would do, you know, several times a day is I would take a hand truck and I would take cardboard boxes and I'd fill them with bound journals and I would carry them from the library, probably 300 feet over to the copy machine. I had free access. To. And if you look at the steps of the library, you'll see chunks of marble I took out with that hand truck. <laughs> I left my scars on that library steps, but maybe they The didn't. last time we were there, we actually looked for them and they were still there. <laughs> I, I, you know, Mary likes to read novels. I like to read research papers. Yeah, that, that's that's the difference in in what turns you on. You know, research turns me on, and uh, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you how it started. <clears throat> Is I, I wanted to be important. I wanted to be known, and uh, you know, based upon certain things and certain businesses, you gain power. Like for example, if you're in the banking business, the amount of money you collect gives you status. If you're in the real estate business, the amount of property you collect gives you status. In, in the medical profession, the way you get status is uh, 
you collect knowledge. Now, I didn't think I'd ever be able to learn as much about cardiology as a cardiologist who went through three years of training did, or a gastroenterologist who went through three extra years of training. I, you know, I didn't think I'd ever learn as much as they did, but I think I have because I developed a passion. I think you've learned more. I've developed a passion, but there was this area of medicine that nobody knew anything about. And that was diet therapy, which, you know, the library is filled with tens of thousands of articles that were valueless. They just collected dust because nobody could make a profit off them. And I became an expert, a world expert overnight. Well, to do it longer than that. <laughs> In a week. <laughs> By, by just, uh, you know, by, by, by opening up a field that has been, of course, opened up a lot these days. Uh, anyway, that's, that's how I got started. That was one of the motivating factors in me getting started is uh, it allowed me to gain status. Plain and simple. But I love the, I love the material, too. I loved, I loved seeing a, a couple of things. One is I love seeing that what I was taught during my very expensive education neglected an entire, very important, the most essential part of health, which is food. It was totally neglected. I love discovering this. And the other thing I love discovering was even though on the wards, in the operating room, in my general practice, I saw that the treatments failed. I saw that the patients didn't do well if they had heart surgery or breast cancer surgery or took diabetic pills. I could see it right in front of my eyes. Well, when I went to the library, I saw that everybody else saw it too, and they published it. One thing nice about the medical business is it publishes its results, good or bad. And I'll tell you, they're hugely disappointing when it comes to chronic disease, hugely. And it was nice knowing that. You know, uh, even to this day, I'll sit down with uh, experts. 10 minutes into the conversation with say a cardiologist or a neurologist or whatever, I think I can still do this. Uh, they would say to me, you know as much about my field as I do. And I'd say, of course, doctor. I said, why, why would I talk to you if I didn't? You know, I, can't, I come prepared. And that's the way a lot of my interactions went with my colleagues is, yeah, I've read the same stuff you've read and what you do doesn't work. And you're lying <laughs> to the public and the patients about it, plain and simple. And that's what I tried to share with you in this this conversation is you're being lied to. You're being lied to so that people can make money. And you think that's new? I bet it happens in your field too. So Dr. McDougall, does John need to take statins if he's never had a cardiac event with his numbers 236 oh, yeah, yeah. TC LDL 158? Well, the benefits of statins are very small. I showed you a, a number to treat figure that you can, you can find the reference to, you just look at the bottom right-hand corner of the slide and that shows the newsletter where I give you the scientific references of where it's from. And based upon that information, you can see that it's in the tiny percentages. I just got a recent article on statins that a different way of looking at their benefits that shows at best you live a few hours longer by taking statins compared to, opposed to not. But, you know, Maybe a little bit in very sick people. And I'm gonna I'm gonna give my patients that advantage. Same thing with, with baby aspirin. I'm gonna give them that advantage because they deserve that. They deserve to have all the expertise I've gathered. And uh, my initial answer is, you know, maybe you shouldn't. And the reason you shouldn't is because your cholesterol will go low on your statin therapy, and you'll say to yourself, don't have to change my diet, I already fixed it. If that keeps you away, success with drugs to treat numbers keeps you away from fixing the problem, then I've done you a disservice. If you wanna take advantage of the tiny bit of benefit that's been, that's been seen by good scientific research, then do it, I, I prescribe it for you. No, no, I wouldn't. Even with a cholesterol 250, I wouldn't prescribe statins uh, if you were my patient. If it, that, along with you had a history of heart attack, or heart surgery, or stroke, then I would. 
uh, I would be more encouraging. But if you had, in other words, primary prevention, you're a healthy person, I wouldn't treat you, regardless of the number. You'd be so proud of me, Dr. McDougal. Before this broadcast, I went to the doctor. I'm not sick or anything, but I just have something called TMJ and I needed my prescription for physical therapy renewed. So I had to go to the doctor to get that. And she said, well, uh, how long has it been since your last pap smear, mammogram, colonoscopy and bone density test? Because I think it's time to schedule. I said, I'm not having any of those. And she goes, really? Why? And I said, because number one, I don't want to I want to know. And if I do, I'm not going to do anything any different anyway. And she looked at me like, like, yeah. she didn't know what to say. And she goes, okay. But I, I just, <laughs> you know, some, some of you have heard my lecture on, uh, on early detection tests. And I did a review. Uh, I think it was my August, 2016 newsletter. Uh, I did a review on early detection tests, mammographies, colonoscopies, and so I've written a lot about that. And the truth of the matter is, is that some of these tests like colonoscopy reduce your risk of dying of colon cancer, but they don't reduce your risk of overall dying. Total mortality is not reduced by any screen technique. What happens is you make catch a few cancers and make a difference. But in the process, you killed a few people in the operating room or with the cancer chemotherapy you gave them. So total mortality is the same. Realize that, you know, you're not gonna live longer by having these tests done. It'll just determine what you die of. And that goes for mammographies, self-examination, it goes for uh, all the different types of colon rectal cancer testing, lung cancer screening. There's no screening method that improves uh, overall mortality. But it turns you into a patient. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's great for the medical business because, uh, because uh, you cast this huge net over the population. It's called disease mongering. You take healthy per people and you turn them into patients. Well, what happens when you tell the population of people that they must enter the medical business by having screening done? Just think of the business created, huge. You know, that, that's the, the primary benefit of screening techniques is to the businesses, not to you. Now, I do recommend some uh, early detection procedures. I recommend pap smears for women who are sexually active between the ages of say, 21, 28 to age 50, you should have pap smears done. And these are general recommendations held by every gynecologic organization in the world. You know, I'm not stepping on a line. If you have uh, two negative pap smears, then you should get a follow up pap smears every three to five years and stop. You know, I say age 50, some people say stop at age 60. Those are standard recommendations. Uh, I told you that screening for colon rectal cancer reduces your risk of a of a specific disease you're gonna die from, which is colon cancer. Not by much, just a tiny bit. But on the other hand, you'll increase your risk of dying from surgery, from the chemotherapy, from radiation, and the overall mortality is the same. So, you know, I do, I do say you should get pap smears done. I do say you should take uh, colon rectal cancer screening, but that's a whole new lecture. I'll just tell you what my bottom line is is you should do it by checking your stool, uh, not by having colonoscopies, because they're dangerous. Like the Cologuard? Do you like the Cologuard? That's the one I'll do if they make me. Well, you know, they're, they're $600 a test, and they're, they're no better than stool for blood. But yeah, Cologuard is okay. They're a new high-profit technique that's, that's advertised excessively on, uh, on TV. And yeah, they, they work. Uh, I, I think that's an acceptable way to do it. Don't, no harm done, just to your pocketbook. But there are also, uh, also tests for blood and for genetic material in the, um, in the stool that are just as effective at, at reducing your risk of dying. And I also recommend, so, so let's say my recommendations for colon, colon cancer screening are check stool for blood and maybe for three or four years and it cost you less than $40, no harm done. Uh, I recommend that you do that. That's enough. That's enough 
for your screening method. That's what the US Preventative Services Task Force says. The Canadian Task Force on Preventative Medicine has told Canadian citizens, citizens as of 2016 not to get colon, colonoscopies done. Just like European countries, they do not recommend colonoscopies. But what the other thing I, I recommend is as another way of dealing with this issue is to have a sigma exam done, one, one exam when you're about 60 years old, that's enough. And the sigmoid is very effective. That's a two foot tube, never results in perforations, never, it's uh, no discomfort. You don't have to have an anesthesia. It's done in the doctor's office. Two foot tube is stuck up your butt. Now, when you have a colonoscopy done, you've got a six to eight foot tube stuck up through your intestines. There are all kinds of torturous turns that occur in the large intestine and you re it results in bleeding and perforations. A Kaiser Hospital study done showed that 7% of people when they had polyps detected had serious complications from a colonoscopy. The, uh, the risk of having a perforation, which half the cases it's lethal, is about one in 2000 patients. But if you're that one patient, that's a big deal. <laughs> if you're the family of that patient, that's a huge deal. So, you know, th these are tests with risks. Like I say, in Canada, they recommend against them. So do they in Europe. The US, uh, the US Preventative Task Force still considered a colonoscopy the gold standard, but then they turn around and tell you that you get the same results by checking the stool for blood. That's a whole lecture I'm going to give in the future. <laughs> well, we can't wait. Well, based on today's lecture, there was a question in the chat. Does losing weight on a low-fat diet cause fat to continue to circulate through the vascular system? Yeah. Yeah, what happens is the fat is dissolved and it, it leaves the body by going into the blood vessels. And uh, if you lose weight, uh, your triglycerides, which is the fat in your blood, it often goes up. But in that fat is also stored a huge amount of chemicals, toxic chemicals, because environmental chemicals are fat soluble, but it's stored in the body fat. And one of the things that people may use as an excuse for not losing weight is you get this big flush of toxic chemicals released by your body fat as you lose weight. I think it's irrelevant because the overall health benefits for losing the weight far outweigh the risk of poisoning yourself by storing up chemicals during your decades of life, eating animal foods. That's how you store, store up the chemicals. That's the primary source is eating high on the food chain. But yeah, yeah, yeah that the fat appears in the blood a little bit, but it's no big deal. It just kind of goes away. Dr. McDougall, everybody's talking about some free books. I must, I might've missed it because I was monitoring the chat. So yeah. you mentioned something about that. Where do they get them? How well, they just go to our website and they will find uh, that offer of the, you can get the three books. Uh, there are three more that we're gonna release that I own. And uh, there's no gimmicks. We don't ask you to buy anything or sign up for the newsletter or take any pledge or make a donation to our foundation. We just plain and simple are giving them away. Why am I giving them away? Well, it doesn't do me any good or you any good for me to keep them tucked away on my computer. You know, they're great books. Uh, as I say, I put a lot of work into writing them. I'd like them out in the public. I'd like you to take these books and share them with your friends and relatives and, and your medical doctors and your dietitians. Yeah, because you can help me spread the word. But there, it's on my website. Uh, okay. I'm on your website now. Where do I go to shop first? And then, well, to well, you know, I think you should ask Heather. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get that information and put it in the chat I, afterwards. I think Heather, Heather's maybe on the line. Maybe she'll email you. Okay, maybe I can text her. Mary, here's a fun question for you. What is your favorite meal and what's your favorite way to prepare a potato? Kathy wants to know. Oh, my favorite meal. Probably my favorite meal is fried rice. I make it with frozen vegetables. Uh, you buy these bags of mixed frozen vegetables and you cook those in a pan on top of the stove. Um, I heat up um, already cooked brown rice. I'm, I'm not, I try and keep things simple. So I have these packages of brown rice that are already cooked and all you have to do is put them in the microwave. And I put that in a bowl. I mix the vegetables together and then um, 
now I have, um, I put a tofu, um, uh, marinated tofu in with the vegetables, which makes it much better. Uh, well, I sure think so. <laughs> oh, I like it, it really, better too. Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. Well, it was, it's really good just plain without the tofu, but the tofu brings a little bit of hardiness to the meal. And, you know, we, we're not concerned about any issues with tofu, like it's 52% fat. Not an issue. The, I mean, it's mostly it's water. A, well, but the amount that you get out of one package of tofu yeah. serves both of us and has enough left over for the next day's lunch. So it's not very much. So well, how, how, about, how about you, do you mix any, uh, any dressings or sauces? Oh, I sometimes put different sauces on them like a teriyaki sauce or um, a peanut sauce, which is, I know high in fat, but I just use a little bit. And, if you uh, notice, we don't have to worry about losing weight. So. Uh, I'm a really good Korean barbecue sauce that I found in uh, one of the supermarkets around here. Um, and I just add a little bit of that and mix it in together. And, um, and so that's my favorite meal. Well, you know, that has been my favorite too uh, for many periods of time, Mary. But that potato dish you cooked. Uh, I was going to mention the yeah. potatoes. But you go ahead, just tell about that. I mean, that was, I was, well, like, it was like eating candy. You know, where you took those potatoes, which weren't russets, yeah, and you boiled them. Like the one we had the other night. The, the one I had yesterday for lunch. Oh, okay. And it, it was, the, the potatoes were so sweet. And it was potatoes and broccoli. What do you tell them? So I, what I did is I, I wanted to have a baked potato meal. And um, I didn't have any russet potatoes. So I had a bag of um, golden potatoes, only they were only about this big, so there weren't too many of them. So I filled the whole bottom of my pan, uh, my Instapot with the potatoes and added about two cups of water and cooked them at high pressure for 20 minutes. And then I let the pressure come down naturally, but you could release it quickly if you wanted to. And then I let them just sit there for a few minutes and cook or and just kind of release the steam. And then I put them on a plate and I cut them in half uh, lengthwise. So they were like little boats. <laughs> and then I put um, some tofu sour cream on the top and some mustard. And I think you put um, A1 sauce or some, some no, no, kind I, of a... There was a, a, a non-fat salad dressing I put in. Oh, dish. okay. But you have to remember this tofu sour cream is relatively high in vegetable fat. And I have to caution you folks that are interested in losing a lot of weight quickly. Yeah. That's not the but way I to go. Didn't, we didn't use much of it. No, we didn't use much of it. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, just, it's just rich. And um, I would have enjoyed the potatoes just as well without it. So I wouldn't consider a sacrifice not to, to have it putting a, a, a low fat salad dressing over the top. It's an easy way to do a non fat salad dressing. Yeah. But you also I serve made, broccoli I, with it. I made um, broccoli and cauliflower and serve that with it along the side or either on the top. But then I also made um, the other night, remember when you wanted baked potatoes, uh -huh. you said, and um, <clears throat> I, I misunderstood, I don't know why, but I made stuffed baked potatoes. Yeah, and we hadn't so, made those in a while. So I made, uh, I had russet potatoes so I made them and I sliced them in half the long ways again, took, so they were like boats, scraped out the inside very carefully so I didn't get any of the shell and put them in a container. I mixed them with frozen vegetables and well, you, then you I, mashed them. I mashed them with oh. frozen vegetables, right. that cooked frozen vegetables. And then I piled them back into the potato and baked them again or broiled oh. them, I guess. So they got brown on the top. And um, again, we had, we had some different kinds of sauces uh, that we'd like to put on top of things. You know, our, our favorites change and we have a repertoire of just about six or eight different <laughs> things that we cook over and over again. Mary makes some really, really good soups. Uh, you must have a lot of your publications of thousands of recipes that they can get on the the McDougall Mobile Cookbook. I think it's $5 to get a thousand recipes. 
or in our books or on the website that are free, uh, you, you, can, you can get uh, many, many different recipes, but we just have a few things that we repeat over and over again. And they do change. Uh, bean burritos used to be my favorite. And then, mm -hmm. I, then I skipped the shell. And now what we do is we just have a bowl of, of beans and rice, rice. and you know, mm -hmm. some, maybe some avocado. Again, you know, it's and high fat. salsa. Right. And lettuce. And the soups, uh, what I was going to say with the soups, I mean, out of the recipes you have, you must have 200 soup recipes. And they're all vegetable soups, which you've been eating your whole life. You just leave the dead animals and the oil out and they taste as good, if not better. So bean soup, pea soup, lentil soup, onion soup. And what we've been having is, uh, is we've been having soup and bread. And maybe, maybe, maybe we should give away all our secrets. <laughs> really? But we, we, Mary does buy bread at the regular grocery, which is uh, take and bake and made with good ingredients and no dairy and no added oil. And we keep them in the refrigerator. And then when she cooks them up, they're just like they came out of the oven at the bakery. Mm -hmm. We have soup and bread quite often. And then we had a, uh, we had a little party meal when Heather was there a couple of weekends ago. Yeah, I heard Everything. that Heather was looking for chocolate and you didn't have any to give yeah, her. She, she, checked out our, she checked out our freezer and refrigerator and she found out we really do what we say we do. <laughs> there was no chocolate ice cream, no non-dairy chocolate ice cream in there. But Mary made a lasagna, which really was a big hit. Uh, which I, have, I have not actually made a lasagna since the fires. I never made it in our new house. I, I guess because there aren't enough people or I just never thought about it. And um, since the family was here and it was gonna be our anniversary meal, yeah. uh, I, may, I, I found ingredients that fit our meal plan. I found no bake lasagna noodles. I found, um, I had a hard time with the, with the pasta sauce, but I found a pasta sauce um, that the olive oil, was the last ingredient on the list. I couldn't find the fat-free ones like I used to get in Santa Rosa. Um, and then I used a, um, a tofu ricotta that I used to make myself, but when the rest, and the recipe is in, in um, it's probably free online called, it's called spinach uh -huh. lasagna or it's in the uh, mobile cookbook. And then I um, used a bag of chopped spinach and I mixed that in with, with the ricotta and I layered it when um, I put the noodles in first and then I layered it in some of the ricotta and I poured some sauce over that and then repeated it until everything was covered and baked it for about an hour and um, it was wonderful. It was a big hit. So it's a great celebration meal in case you're looking for something that would not be a routine thing to do, but uh, something special. Well, we know Doug Lyle loves it because he once said it was his favorite meal of all time. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing, you know, we, that's what we eat and we generally have leftovers for lunch. And breakfast is always the same. I cook breakfast. I cook and clean up with all meals. I clean up. But uh, breakfast is always oatmeal. And we make oatmeal, we make, these days what we're using is frozen fruit because fresh fruit, uh, it spoils and it collects flies. And, you know, it's so easy, so convenient and probably less expensive to buy frozen blackberries and raspberries and, and uh, all kinds of different kinds of berries. Well, yeah, you can just take out a handful yeah. as you need them, put them in a bowl and Microwave them up, up. Yeah. yeah. Microwave them up and throw the oatmeal over the top, and whoa, that's that's a quick, easy, very nutritious meal. In fact, I didn't finish mine this morning because I was busy. Still, still over there. I says I was busy uh, getting ready for this lecture. Well, you said you were going to have it for lunch because for lunch. yeah, he has another lecture at three o'clock. Yeah. Oh my God, that's right. Your dairy lecture. I love that one. Let me just read a nice comment from Carol. Thank you so much for your lifetime of work and all the free information you've offered on your website throughout the years. In addition, thank you for these free books. I've referred so many people to the website. Thank you both for changing my life. 
Well, we never get tired of hearing that. We always like to know we've helped other people. But Absolutely. The program, so, yeah, the program, we're running the program right now. It's, it's sold out. I think there's space available for upcoming programs, but this was, us, as all our programs are sold out. So sign up ahead of time. But we've got a, a nice group of people from uh, all over the world. And they're involved in a telemedicine, telehealth program where I get a chance to lecture tonight. I'm giving the dairy lecture this afternoon. And I give a lecture on cancer, a lecture on heart disease. Uh, I, I, I get a chance to talk a few times. Doug Lyle talks, uh, Jeff Novick talks, uh, Heather talks. Uh, we have a morning chat. We do this every day. Yeah. This causes us to make sure we're up, up and bright early in the morning. <laughs> But every, every morning at 8 a.m. Pacific time, we have a, a, a fireside talk where we get a chance to talk like we are with you now in a very casual manner. And we do that for the whole 12 days. And before that, before the talk, you're greeted by our su support specialists. We have three people who uh, are, well, some, one of them has been with us for 20 years. The other's a, a dietitian, and the other one's been with us for many years also, knows the program well. And they, they do things in the morning, check with you. And of course, morning could be nighttime, Pacific time, because we have people from China, Australia. Well, they so. check your blood pressure and they ask about your weight. They ask about how you're doing, um, if you're having any problems with meals. And um, so they're sort of there to help you every morning um, to give you meal ideas, um, to just, just to encourage you. Um, to keep going. And if you have any questions or you're having any problems, they'll help you with that. This is a one-on-one -on -one experience between you and our health uh, specialist. And I don't want to forget something that's crucial that uh, she was, uh, I don't know, there may be another program out there that does it, but we offer medical care. Uh, we have a board certified doctor, Dr. Anthony Lim, who's extremely talented, who uh, sees every patient three times during the program. We take you off the drugs. And uh, we also put you on some drugs if you need them. So we're real doctors with real prescription pads. And uh, so you get the medical care that you need, particularly if you're transitioning from you know, a load of insulin and a handful of diabetic pills and heart pills and cholesterol pills and indigestion pills and whatever. We're gonna stop them or reduce them if we can. And our data published shows that uh, people are able to reduce or stop their medications in 90% of the cases, especially with blood pressure and diabetic medications. Uh, our goal, and you know, your goal should be it too. You, you should be, your goal should be to get off drugs. Sick people take drugs. You don't want to be a sick person anymore. You want to be off your medications. You don't want to have your life dominated by the medical business. And you don't want to have your days dominated by when am I going to take this pill or that pill? And, you know, can I go on vacation? Oh, I got a doctor's appointment and oh boy, can I save enough money to have this operation and get away from these people and we'll help you do it with medical care, uh, expert medical care. And I get a chance to see a few people too here and there. You know, they ask the old guy once in a while for some help, and I, I usually have something to say. I hope it's worthwhile. So Valerie says, when COVID ends, will you return to in person? You pretty much said no, right? We're not going to. Our staff would rebel. You know, our, everybody would be on the people. We ask this question every time a person has been through both programs. We get a lot of return visit. We ask them, you know, will you tell us what you think about the online internet program versus the time you spent with us in Santa Rosa. Every single person says that the online visit is so much more rewarding. We see better results, medical results in the online uh, experience. And people are cooking in their own kitchens. You know, they're not served by food prepared in a kitchen by an expert chef at a dining table at a resort. And then I have to go home and say, what do I do now? And uh, so it's, it's been a huge boost to our ability to help people. And it's a huge boost to everybody's happiness. No, we're, not, we're never gonna do it. Hopefully we never have to do it. I don't, never say never, I mean, you never know. We might, we, might, we might do it, 
it's just like uh, one thing we have uh, so an awful lot of fond memories of is we've done about 28 McDougal adventure tours where we've taken groups of people all over the North and South hemispheres, taking them to Galapagos, we've taken them to Costa Rica, Hawaii, uh, many different places. We took them to, to the Mardi Gras down the Amazon River. And you know, the idea of returning back to doing those is appealing, but the idea of getting on a cruise ship with all this COVID stuff going on is pretty scary. Uh, we'll probably never do those, but we'll have lots of lots of memories of, of the trips that we took. That is cool. So question from Jean in the chat. We were talking about heart disease today. How important is exercise? Uh, well, uh, do you remember Jim Fix? Yep. Jim Fix, he wrote the, the book on running. And he said that if you can run a marathon, you'll never die of heart disease. Well, his gravestone said he died at 56 of heart disease. The, the, the graveyards are littered with people who believe that, that exercise is protective from heart disease. Uh, Nathan Pritikin used to say that you should not start an exercise program, a serious exercise program, until after you've changed your diet, because things are so unstable. To introduce this kind of stress is not a good idea. So you be careful with exercise. I think you should pick a moderate, something like, like walking and uh, stationary bikes at home would be a good idea. Maybe swimming, rowing. Now that's the kind of exercise you'll look into for good health. Now, if you're like me, you can find entertainment and exercise. You know, like, you know, if I can get out there on my windsurfer and sail across the ocean blue, knowing that there are great big white sharks right below me, that's not health food. That's not a healthy experience. They bite. But I do it for pleasure, and that's okay. I'm willing to take that risk. And you may take that same risk by getting into running programs or bicycling out in traffic and so on. So don't think this is for your health. This is for your pleasure. And, uh, you know, it, so a little exercise is fine. Well, and then walking is enough. Yeah, walking is walking's ideal. That's what people are designed to do is walk. You know, that's what most people do is they walk. Yep. So, if you run too much, you can ruin your knees. Yeah, ruin your knees and ankles and hips and fall down. <laughs> you get hit by a car, fall in a rut. So it's, a, it's a dangerous sport to get aggressive when it comes to activities. But yes, exercise will cause you to lose weight faster. But when you stop the exercise program, you're going to gain it back if you haven't fixed the food. Uh, it's the exercise did not lower cholesterol or prevent heart disease or any kind of cancer. You know, why don't you go for the whole tamale? Is that okay to say? Yeah, the whole tamale. I mean, just why don't you just fix the problem instead of dealing on the periphery with a bunch of nonsense? It's the food, and it's inexpensive food, it's food that's good for the planet, which is where I'm focusing my attention these days is on using the diet that we've taught for 44 years as an aid to helping change uh, what's going on, which is really scary. Uh, the estimates are that half of the greenhouse gases are produced by agriculture, animal agriculture, not just agriculture, animal agriculture. And the Eat Lancet Commission says that if you change your diet, you can reduce your contribution of greenhouse gases by 50 to 80 percent overnight. Overnight. I mean, you're, you're, you're recycling, you're, you're driving a hybrid car, and you ask, what else can I do to at least make me feel good and maybe to make a difference? What else can I do? Well, if you want to do the big deal, you can change your diet. And that's, that's where, the, that's where our, our last card is to play. You know, we got we to gotta fix uh, transportation and fossil fuels and we got a lot of things to fix, but in, unless we fix the food, we're not gonna we're not gonna have a rosy future, folks. So spread the good news. If if you've already accomplished good health and you've got that message in line, I encourage you to get out and tell people the good news about the planet. That Mother Earth needs a break. <laughs> My new patient, you know, I practice diet therapy. I practice it on thousands and thousands of people. My two new patient is planet Earth. 
She needs diet therapy. She needs a break. Yep. Speaking of diet therapy, question from Susan. Where did it go? And this is, um, have you ever seen a patient who had a heart attack and then switched to an exclusively whole food plant-based diet, but still needed statins to control cholesterol levels? Yes, I have. I, I've seen them. You know, there, there are people who have family tendencies to higher cholesterol. The average cholesterol for people in the U.S. is about 250 milligrams per deciliter. But there are people who eat the typical American diet that run cholesterol is of four to 500. And uh, these would be people that just have a tendency towards high cholesterol. They don't have any genetic problems. And then there are people who have heterozygous hypercholesterolemia. In other words, they have half the genes that cause serious elevation of cholesterol. And they may run cholesterol in the 800 range. And then there are people who have homozygous. In other words, both genes uh, cause you to have high cholesterol and they run cholesterols, you know, a thousand. They die of heart disease in their teens and twenties. So yeah, I, I, you know, if, if it's uh, other than the average person and they've extended everything they can in terms of a good diet, I'll, I'll try cholesterol lowering medication. Again, I told you, I'm just a regular old doctor. I'm gonna, I'm gonna treat you with everything I think that might make a difference, but I'll tell you, my experience teaches me another side, and that is I've taken care of several women who had cholesterols in the 300 range, 350. Remember, your ideal is 150 and norm may be 200, 210. They run cholesterols in the 350 and they couldn't take statins, even though I encouraged, I'm sure I did. And we studied their heart arteries by doing uh, ultra-fast CT scans, and their arteries were baby clean no plaque at all, every single case. So just shows you that uh, I'm not always right. You know, my suppositions are, don't always pay off. And uh, you know, I learn something from my patients quite often. You don't, you don't wanna focus, you wanna focus on the food first. The medications should be secondary approaches that you use, which hopefully cause you more good than harm. Diet causes all good, no harm. Right. Question from Cheryl, if this way of eating can help AFib. Well, in a sense, uh, the Framingham study showed that AFib occurs in people who eat the Western diet. And what it is, is the, instead of the big blood vessels becoming diseased, which are the vessels they study are the big ones, the more peripheral vessels, the tiny ones, the ones that supply the, uh, the, the nutrients to the nerves, and to the muscles, the end, end, end vessels, which you can't see on the angiogram, they get plugged up. And uh, as a result, the, the nervous tissues of the heart become damaged and you develop atrial fibrillation. This is permanent. You don't go back into normal sinus rhythm by changing your diet, except you know in some rare lucky case. Uh, it's not so bad to have atrial fib. Uh, my mother had it. She lived another 20 years without taking blood thinning drugs, by the way, or any medication. So I, I treat a lot of patients with AFib because it's quite common. And uh, the way that I treat them is I give them digoxin, which is the time on a drug to slow their rate because you need to have a rate below 110 beats per minute. And if that doesn't solve so slowing the rate, I'll put them on beta blockers and I'll use blood thinning medications to help prevent a stroke. You see blood clots when you have a, 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 a wobbly bag of an atrium. It doesn't effectively pump blood. It, it allows the blood to get stagnant. And as a result, you can form blood clots, which in rare cases uh, go to the brain and cause uh, strokes. And so what we do is we treat them with blood thinners, uh, new drugs like Equilus and the old drug is a uh, Coumadin that we used to use. And some people used aspirin to thin the blood, but that was never the standard therapy. Now, anybody who has atrial fib, they need to go uh, and look at some research. One of the evaluations as to whether, the classic one as to whether or not you should take these uh, blood thinning drugs is uh, called the CHADS study, C-H-A-D-S. You can find it in Wikipedia, you can find it on the internet, CHADS. And, it's an acronym for uh, various risk factors associated with a risk of 
having a stroke. And they, they give you a scoring system. And uh, depending on your age and whether you have diabetes or high blood pressure or had a stroke or heart attack, you get certain points. And uh, you can change some of these scores by changing your diet, like you can get rid of high blood pressure or diabetes or high cholesterol. You can't get rid of age. <laughs> Uh, so if you run a low score, then the CHADS evaluation says that you'll be better off not taking the, these blood thinning drugs, even though I would say every doctor, you know, well, maybe a few exceptions, by reflex, they put people who have atrial fib on blood thinning drugs. They're not supposed to. They're supposed to put only high risk patients on atrial on blood thinning drugs. These, these things thin the blood. They cause gastrointestinal bleeding, which people die from. They cause hemorrhagic strokes. You wanna have some best guess as to whether the, the approach you're taking is gonna do you more good than harm. And a CHAD score, C-H-A-D-S, is gonna help you make that judgment. And your doctor should be paying attention to it. Dr. McDougall, there's a question, but it's not on heart disease. Is it okay to ask? Oh, for you, AJ, I would do anything. Well, it's, it's, on, it's on my favorite topic, which is your least favorite topic, which is weight loss. Yeah. But Julie wrote in and said, with, she thanks you so much for your talks. And she says, Dr. McDougall, I've heard you say that in order to lose weight, we need to cut down on the fruit. But when you look at a calorie density chart, fruit actually has fewer calories than potatoes, yeah. grains, or beans. So what is it about reducing fruit instead of other starches that could help us lose weight? Well, first of all, you love fruit. And you could, if there wasn't some kind of restriction, you could eat 2000 calories of nectarines. Easily, I've done it. Well, those calories count. So that's one reason is you're familiar with the taste of fruit. It's accessible. You think it's health food and it, you know, it is health food, but you can overdo it. So I suggest people on average eat about four fruits a day and in the maximum weight loss, I suggest you eat fewer. How much is fewer? Well, maybe zero, maybe one. The other thing about fruit, fruit is simple sugar. Simple sugars raise insulin in your body, your blood. Insulin pushes fat into fat cells. So again, there's another advantage you can do for maximum weight loss. So on the regular program, you know, you can eat enough fruit. Probably even a lot more than I say. <laughs> Uh, but if, if you're trying to trying to push the system to its limits and lose as much weight as you can by the time summer comes and you need to put your bikini on, you still wear bikinis? No. No, sorry. That's my that's my old, that's my old age. Uh, I'm, I'm dated, right? Well, I am, well anyway. Going you know, the, Dr. McDougall, those people, and again, I know this isn't the, the diet you recommend, but I, I've talked to so many people that are like fruitarians and, and they're thin that all they eat is fruit. I mean, they're not eating any starch, which I don't understand, but they're not overweight when they just I, eat. You mentioned the guy's name. I've known him for years. I forget. Uh, Dr. Doug Graham. Yeah, Doug Graham, right. You know, he's got a lot of good ideas, but the idea that you shouldn't eat starch, that you should eat fruit, I don't agree with. Uh, I, I, you say you've known a lot of fruitarians. I haven't. Not, not a lot. It just seems the ones that come on the show are always lean. Oh, sure. I, I don't, I, you know, it, I don't I, know. I, I can't think of a, of a fruitarian that I, that I can remember. I mean, I saw a few in my early days of practice, but that was the real radical fringe of society was fruitarians. Uh, Steve Jobs was a fruitarian during his college years for a short time. You know, it's, it's pretty tough to live on just fruit. It's not satisfying. It's not satisfying long-term. Because it's simple sugars, you get immediate satisfaction. It goes away in minutes. Yeah. Whereas starch, which releases its carbohydrates slowly, sustains you between meals. I agree. I, I can't, I don't understand people that don't eat it. I don't know how they're uh, not. You know, people, people like to hear gimmicks. And fruitarian is a gimmick. There's no population of people that ever walked this planet who were fruitarians. Every population that walked this planet were starch eaters, except for kings and queens and Eskimos and, and Americans. What Basically. about these people that say they're breatharians? Is that real? Oh, you know, I, I knew the breatharian. And when I was practicing in Honolulu, he came and got some newspaper articles and so on. And what he told people is they didn't have to eat it, they would just get 
everything you needed from the air and all you had to do is breathe. Well, one of the front page newspaper articles was breathitarian caught at 7-Eleven buying Twinkies and candy bars. Come on. If you, if you can believe somebody lives on air, you've got a problem, you know? <laughs> uh, anyway, this guy got caught. That's the only breatharian I ever knew. It happened That's in Honolulu in the 1970s. That's hilarious. Someone's asking about orthostatic hypoten hypotension and salt. They drink a gallon of water a day. Well, uh, all I can offer is uh, a caution that you get up carefully and don't fall. I don't know that eating salt will help the problem. If it did, you wouldn't be asking the question. So, uh, you know, you just gotta be real careful that you don't get yourself in a situation where you stand up suddenly and all the blood falls to your feet because of gravity. But I don't know any way of, of fixing it easily. Uh, there are some people wear compression stockings and some people try high salt diets and I, I just be careful. Once you're up and around, it's not a problem. Yeah. Just stay standing all the time. <laughs> well, no, just get up carefully or make sure that you, you know, you. if you do fall, you fall on something that has cushions or you won't get hurt. Yeah. So what do you have for us next month? You're, I know you're doing a different topic every yeah, I am. I, you know, I haven't picked it. Maybe you can help me pick what I do next. But I think I'm going to do autoimmune diseases. Uh, autoimmune disease is a big, big topic. What I've tried to do is I've tried to give you some basic understanding so that the rest of everything flows and you can understand it. Like today, the lesson was, is that it's not the hard fibrous non-lethal plaques that doctors easily find with their instruments and are able to treat with their instruments and surgery. Those aren't the killers. What well, the killers are, are the tiny little pustules that pop which you rarely can find, which we have no treatment for other than something radical like eating a healthy diet. That was the lesson for today. The lesson from the breast cancer lecture I gave was that by the time you discover cancer of any kind, it's been growing for 10 years. If it's really cancer, it's already spread. All you can do is, all you're left with is, it explains to you why early detection doesn't work. It explains to you why cutting your, off your breast or having a radiation of your breast can't work. It's a 10 year old disease by the time you find it. So once you understand the basis, then you know how to act. You stop going for aggressive mutilating treatments, sickening treatments, and, and you deal with something that does slow the progression of the disease, which is changing your diet. I told you that February 13, 2015, Proclamation from the American Cancer Society was that every doctor should be recommending a diet in the direction we teach to every cancer patient. You read that newsletter. It's my February 2015 newsletter. It's official. That's what makes a difference. Have you heard about it since? No. Why not? Why not? Why haven't you heard about it? This is the importance of eating a healthy diet, not just to prevent cancer, but once you get it. That was the basic message from that lecture. The basic message from the, from the diabetes lecture was to make you understand the spectrum of diabetes. From type one, where there is uh, no insulin, to type two, where there's often twice as much insulin as a normal person, but the body has become insulin resistant. Once you understand that, everything makes sense. And so the rest of the lecture on cancer, on heart disease, and this one, or excuse me, cancer and diabetes, and this one on heart disease should have flowed nicely. Like for example, on heart disease, once you understand that what is the killer, the volatile pimples, not the hard fibrous calcified plaques that they treat, then you understand why heart surgery doesn't save lives. And I gave you all the studies. It doesn't say it can never save lives. You know, it, it all makes sense. And then you understand what you're left with is something that costs nothing, has no side effects, is good for the planet, gives you a great bowel movement. It's the food. It stops the chest pain. Dean Ardish told you it reduces chest pain episodes by 91% in three weeks. 
In the other studies, I showed you there's a 100% reduction of chest pain episodes. Simply by changing your diet, chest pain is, well, is one of the indications for heart surgery. Since it doesn't save lives, it's, it can only treat symptoms. So if you have symptoms so bad that it spoils your life, you may have a reason to have heart surgery, but first you ought to have good medical therapy, which are the drugs that help relieve chest pain, the beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, nitroglycerins. But more importantly, you ought to have the diet that stops the sludging of the blood, that drops the oxygen tension by 20%. You must have gotten that lecture. Otherwise, I'm going to give the same lecture next <laughs> in two weeks. You know, I... The truth is simple and easy to understand. If I'm not coming across to you, please write, please write AJ a letter. Tell him that this guy's confusing. He's too complicated. It's way above my level of understanding. Don't have him on again. But if I'm doing my job, if I really understand my subject, I ought to be too able to talk to a, a seven-year-old. I ought to be able to talk to anybody of any educational level. You don't have to be a professor, a scientist, or a doctor. If I understand my subject, then I ought to be able to explain it to you. I think I did. I think in every lecture I did, in every lecture that will happen in the future, I will. And to bring up what's the next lecture on, it's on autoimmune diseases. And I'm going to show you how you can tie together. Just like today, I showed you how to tie together hearing loss, impotence, strokes because of the 60,000 miles of blood vessels. I'm going to show you how you can tie together rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, and a whole slew of other autoimmune diseases where the body attacks itself. You're going to understand this after the lecture. So please join me. It's going to take me an entire two weeks to put this together. And I'll work day and night. Mary knows. <laughs> Mary knows that I'm, I'm a type A personality and I you know, for this, for the, for your show, J, AJ, for your show, I'm willing to give up my social life. You know, I'm willing to, uh, anyway, you get the point. Is well, the most important to me is that I bring, bring a, a really entertaining and important educational opportunity to your listeners. Well, you are a great showman and we so appreciate it. And Dr. McDougall, I could talk to you for more than three hours, but my bladder can't. So, oh, right. gonna, <laughs> and I can't leave, but thank you. And Dr. McDougall, I also wanted to thank you because I am so excited about tomorrow's show. My guest is going to be a little bit later at 2.30 PM, but thanks to you for introducing me. We're going to be talking about whether or not psychiatric medicines do more harm than good. And it's none other than Robert Whitaker. So thank you so much for being this, so generous. This, this, you don't want to miss this man. Uh, Robert Whitaker is a science writer and he'll tell you about the dangers of these drugs and then maybe I'll get a chance to tell you about how to treat these psychiatric problems by changing your diet which he doesn't teach as far as I know but there are a whole bunch of tools uh, diet and lifestyle tools that relieve depression and I will have a chance to talk to you about them someday absolutely well we so appreciate you coming on we have such a wonderful time spending time with you Thank you so much, Dr. McDougall and Mary. Thanks. It was AJ. fun. Thanks, AJ. Yeah. Absolutely. Take care. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please do come back tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. for this very important discussion about psychiatric meds. We have Robert Whitaker. Have a nice lunch, you guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.